So I wrote a book called uh, The Resistance Training Revolution, and um, it's, it's about resistance training, but really the goal is to change the, the, the current common fitness paradigm, which is wrong, and it's been causing, uh, hasn't been solving our chronic health issues. And the fitness industry really is the place where we should be able to solve a lot of our chronic health issues, including obesity and diabetes and dementia and cognitive decline, osteopenia. We have the solutions, and unfortunately, we, have, we haven't been providing them the right way. Well, you know, this, this, I mean, I, I said when you, when you walked in, it totally hit a nerve with me because yeah. you talk all about how cardio is bad. Mm. And I'm like a card. I am one of those people that you talk about in the book, which is a cardio junkie. And it, you know, it's one of those things where for me anyway, uh, and I think a lot of people would maybe agree that cardio for them is a way it's more of a mental thing, totally. even not just a physical thing. Yes. But talk about why you think cardio is bad. So it's not bad. Cardio has its benefits. All exercise done properly and appropriately um, provides value. Now you're a fitness fanatic, so I wouldn't be worried about someone like you because you're gonna be consistent no matter what. Mm. You're always gonna be, um, you value your health, it's a priority, and you've been doing it for a long time and you're very consistent with it. I'm trying to talk to the average person uh, with the book. Mm. And when, when we're talking to the average person, you have to understand the context uh, that we're dealing with. Number one, uh, modern life is very sedentary, right? So we don't move much at all. The consequence of that is we have very weak bodies. Our muscle mass is very low, we're not very strong. And there are lots of consequences that come from that, right? So low muscle mass causes insulin resistance. We have uh, mobility issues. And because of that, our metabolisms aren't very fast. And so we, it's very easy for us to become overweight. We're also simultaneously very busy. So although we're sedentary, we don't move. Uh, excuse me, we're, we're very busy, meaning I don't, they don't, people don't have a lot of time or at least don't want to make a lot of time exercising all the time. Right. And remember, I trained people for over two decades and I trained, I definitely trained some athletes and I definitely trained some fitness fanatics, but the vast majority of my clients were everyday average people. Um, just your regular, you know, person who wants to improve their health. And to be quite honest, the mo and this is again, based on my experience training hundreds of people, but then thousands by proxy because I managed gyms and I trained trainers for a long time. The most we can hope for with the average person in terms of exercise consistency on a long-term basis is about two or three days a week. It's not, we're not going to get people to work out every single day, not the average person forever. Right. It's just not going to happen. But we can, and I've done this very successfully, right. is get people to, be, to exercise two or three days a week long-term. So we're sedentary but busy. We, don't, we, we, we typically can't work out all the time uh, very consistently. Um, and also, we're surrounded by hyper palatable, easy to access, inexpensive food, right? Mm -hmm. So high calorie environment, weak bodies, slow metabolisms, don't have a lot of time to dedicate to exercise. All right, what's the exercise solution? How can I work out in a way that's going to be as impactful as possible? Right. And when you understand that context, it's, it's clearly resistance training. Resistance training provides that. Now, to, to, to give you a little more information before I go into that, for a long time now, Actually, for decades now, we've been kind of sold this, this fitness paradigm that's just wrong. And, the, and it kind of goes like this, right? So obesity is the, is the main issue. We ha we're in obesity epidemic. And obesity is kind of like this umbrella condition that contributes to all kinds of chronic health issues. Um, and we know that in order to prevent obesity or to reverse it, we have to create uh, a, a beneficial energy imbalance. So that's a fancy way of saying... We need to take in less calories than we burn, or to put it differently, burn more calories than we take in, right? So if you burn more calories than you take in, you lose weight. If you burn less calories than you take in, you gain weight. Now, that's very true. That's a, that's a, that's a true statement. It's a law of thermodynamics. The problem is we viewed exercise as a way to burn calories. We have not viewed exercise as a way to get the body to adapt to burn more calories mm -hmm. on its own, right? So, so we think, okay, Exercise is a great way to burn calories. Let me pick the form of exercise that burns the most calories. And that makes sense when you think of it from that standpoint. And so you're gonna pick cardio. If you do 45 minutes of any exercise and your goal is just to burn the most calories, running is gonna burn more calories than Pilates, yoga, or, or resistance training, lifting weights, or, or using machines, right? It's gonna burn the most calories. But the problem is cardiovascular activity, number one, you don't burn as many calories as you think. So right. an hour of hard cardio, by the way, your 
cardio machines or treadmills are are lying to you. You know, they'll say they burn 800 calories or whatever. That's not true. 100%. It's such a, it's such a lie. Even these watches, by the way, yeah. are not. Yeah, accurate. you're going to burn maybe 300, 400 calories an hour of really intense exercise, probably less if you're like most people. So it doesn't burn as many calories as you think. But not only that, but it, it also sends a signal to the body to adapt to get better at that activity. So that's what that's what exercise ultimately does, right? right. So when you're working out, you're challenging your body, your body perceives this as a stress, that's why it's hard. And what your body does is it tries to adapt so that next time it's not stressed with the same insult. Um, so if you just start running, maybe a quarter mile is real hard for you. But if you practice long enough, quarter mile becomes very easy. And then if you want your body to adapt any further, you have to keep increasing the distance or same thing with resistance training, right? add weight to the bar, lift more weight, whatever. So that stress is what gets the body to change. Well, what does cardio, what kind of signal does cardio send the body? Well, you need stamina and endurance for it, but you don't need much strength at all. In fact, you need very little strength right. to do cardiovascular activity. And so in your evidence is look at long distance runners, very skinny, very little muscle, okay? And flabby. Typically, right? Yeah. You don't need strength, you need stamina. And because you're burning calories while you're doing it, your body tries to become better at the cardio, which means becoming a more efficient mm -hmm. calorie burning machine, okay? So more efficient means burn less calories. So over time, what your body does, and studies are clear on this now, and I witnessed this as a trainer for years, but we have the studies to back this up. If your exercise solution for your weight loss problem is cardio, so let's say you do cardio and diet. So you cut your calories and you do cardio. Right. That's what you're doing. And you lose 10 pounds. It's very clear now, studies will show, yep. that you'll lose half of that as muscle. Now you might think to yourself, oh, at least I burned half of it as body fat. Not really, because you're the same body fat percentage. You have just made yourself a smaller, same flabbiness version of yourself, but there's consequences to that because that reduced muscle mass now, you now have a slower metabolism, meaning, it makes it harder for you to maintain and definitely harder to continue to get leaner. So what is cardio weight loss typically look like? Well, it typically looks like you start here, you start doing your cardio, you lose some real fast, plateau real hard, mm -hmm. right? So, oh, 10 pounds is gone, that's it, I'm stuck. Now, if I wanna go any more, I have to do more cardio or cut my calories even more. So you end up in this really terrible situation. Typically, people stop because it's unsustainable. Then they gain the weight back. They don't gain back the muscle that they lost. It all comes back as body fat. Mm -hmm. So now they're the weight that they were at when they first started, but more body fat, less muscle, slower metabolism. Now it's even harder. With resistance training, the signal is very different. Now resistance training, granted, doesn't burn a ton of calories while you do it. At least not traditional resistance training where you do a set and then you rest. And But the signal that it sends to the body is we need strength. We need strength in order to perform this movement. What provides strength? Muscle. Muscle is a very metabolic, metabolically active tissue. It burns a ton of calories. So through that muscle building process, your body learns to burn more and more calories on its own naturally. And so that's the beauty of it, right? So you build a little bit of muscle, you're sitting at your desk all day long, right. you're just burning more calories versus with cardio, I gotta do it manually. This way it's kind of automatic. So what That's is the, a good way of putting it, by the way, the manual versus automatic. Absolutely. Right? And so what does the fat loss look like with resistance training when that's part of your solution? Well, it starts off a little slower. The cardio person lost a little faster initially, but the fat loss from resistance training, first off, it's pure fat. You don't lose any muscle. In fact, you often gain muscle right. while you're doing it. So my goal, by the way, when I would get a client is zero weight loss on the scale for the first couple months. I don't want to see the scale move at all, but I'd like to see a composition change. Yeah. So... You know, if I'm training Mrs. Johnson and two months later, I'm weighing her, body weight's the same, test her body fat. It looks like we lost four pounds of body fat and gained four pounds of muscle. By the way, muscle is very dense, doesn't take up much space. So if, if you lost, if somebody lost 10 pounds of body fat but gained 10 pounds of muscle, they'd be smaller. Right. Because muscle is very dense, it's tight, it's sculpted, it gives people shape, um, it doesn't take up much space. But the weight loss, is a snowball effect. You start to see this happen. And over time, it starts to accelerate where you get more and more fat loss as the metabolism yeah. starts to kick in. And you don't need to do a lot of it. Really for most people, a couple days a week of traditional appropriate resistance training will provide all of those, those benefits. 
And there, there's so much more. There's but so you much say more. that, I mean, like you say two days. So basically a couple things to what you said. Number one, because the cardio becomes a psychological thing, right? Where yes. you have, that's the problem. Like how do you break that psychological, <laughs> you know, vicious cycle? Because, you know, to your point, because it becomes like an endorphin thing, you burn, yes. you kind of feel those endorphins. How does someone who does cardio, how do they switch and pivot from doing that amount of cardio and pivot to the strength right. and give up? Because what will happen initially is you may end up gaining weight initially because right. your body's not used to it. That's right. And can you talk about that? Absolutely. So so that's a different person that I'm talking to, yeah. right? So if I'm talking talk to somebody- about everybody because I think there are people who listen to this are people who work out already, Yes. So right? if I'm talking to somebody and they're like, oh my gosh, I do five days a week of an hour of cardio. I like what you're saying. How do I transition? Well, it's, it's actually much more easy than you think. If you're doing five days a week of, of cardio, bring that down to three days a week and add two days a week of resistance training. So just replace the resistance training for cardio. And then slowly your goal is- But psychologically, it's hard to do that. Of course, it totally is. We tend to become attached to the forms of activity that we, we engage in. By the way, if you do cardio because you enjoy it, I don't want you to stop uh, to try another form of exercise uh, for that you don't like, right? So. At the end of the day, and I would always say this to clients, when someone would ask me, hey, what's the best form of exercise? I would always say the one that you like the most. Yeah, okay? same, same thing. Yeah, consistency is the most important thing. So if you just love cardio and you really don't like resistance training, honestly, one day a week of resistance training will give you some great benefit. And then you could do all the other exercise you want. Like I said earlier in this podcast, uh, all forms of exercise do provide value. So I don't want to, I'm not trying to tell people that, that you know some are bad. All I'm trying to say is, that the for the average person whose goal typically is, I want to lose weight, I want to be fit, I want to be mobile, I want to be healthy, I don't have a lot of time to exercise, what should I focus my time on? Well, then in that case, you pick uh, resistance training. Um, but there's there's so much more, and there's there's a whole there's a there's a lot of reasons as to why. By the way, we're in this position because here we are, right? So you know, we're we're 2021, and resistance training still has this kind of stigma. It still has a stereotype. Now, I remember when I yeah. first started working in gyms in the, I started working out in gyms in the mid 90s and I managed my first club uh, in, I believe it was 1998 when I managed my first gym. And uh, I saw no women in the, in the weight area ever. In fact, the gyms that I managed, they had a separate area for women <laughs> to work out. And, and in their area, they had like five pound dumbbells and a few machines. They just didn't go in the weight training area. And the only people that lifted weights or used resistance training were people who were interested in building lots of muscle. Yeah. Everybody else was doing classes or treadmill or swimming, but nobody really was doing resistance training. Um, and, and today we've moved quite a bit, Yeah. but it's still stigmatized. I still, if I talk to the average person, now if I talk to a fitness fanatic, I think they're more in the know, right? But if I talk to, you know, your neighbor who, you know, they don't really work out, but right. the doctor said, hey, you your should. blood lipids are off. You need to start exercising. If I said, hey, you should start lifting weights. Oh, no, I don't want to get big. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not trying to get bulky. Like, I just want to be healthy. Um, so it still carries that stigma. One of the reasons for that, there's many reasons. One of the reasons is the studies that were done on exercise for health were almost never done with resistance training. So although now we see studies... If you go back, you know, two decades, three decades, four decades, when they were studying exercise to see its benefits for overall health and longevity, they never picked resistance training. It was always cardiovascular activity, yeah. always. So we had no idea. All the studies that were done on resistance training were focused on athletic performance and strength. It was never health. So we never knew that resistance training was an amazing form of exercise for your heart, for example. By the, for example, by the way, we now have studies that show that in head-to-head -head competition with cardiovascular activity, resistance training is actually better for heart longevity. No joke. Wow. Absolutely. I saw a study also that said that it's all you can have other detrimental like health effects by doing too much of a cardio, right? You can cause uh, premature aging of the heart and uh, buildup of, of calcium plaques yeah. uh, in the arteries. Uh, and I never knew that. Well, this is why you see some of these extreme endurance athletes that, you know, they, they die early and you're like, what the heck happened? I thought this person. Yeah. And it was just, they, they just went too far. They went too hard and it, and it definitely damages uh, the heart. But yeah. resistance training in these studies are, are is actually better for longevity and for heart health. Um, for cognitive 
benefits, uh, and especially to prevent Alzheimer's and dementia. And that's this is a big deal, by the way. Alzheimer's is just yeah. it's becoming a big problem. Only one there was a, a study done out of uh, Sydney, Australia, and they found that resistance training, strength training, to date is the only form of exercise that's been shown to halt the progression. Really? Yes, halt the progression of uh, of things that happen that cause Alzheimer's. The only form of exercise. Now you may be wondering, well, how, how? Why yeah. is this possible? Researchers sometimes will call Alzheimer's or dementia type three diabetes, right? So we have type one diabetes, yeah. type two diabetes, and they'll sometimes refer to it as, in fact, if you Google type three diabetes, you'll see Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, I've never heard that before. It's not an official term, but the reason why they'll use that sometimes is because they believe it's our brain and body's inability to utilize uh, glucose properly. So it's almost like diabetes. Like, my brain can't, this is why when you take people who, are on, uh, who have Alzheimer's and you yeah. put them on a ketogenic diet, right. no sugar, and all of a sudden they have cognitive improvements. It's because it's as if their brain isn't able to use glucose like it used to. Right. And this leads to these problems. Okay. One of the best uh, protect, protections you could do, you could possibly do for yourself to improve insulin sensitivity is to build muscle. Yeah. In fact, building muscle will improve your insulin sensitivity and protect you from uh, diabetes, regardless of your body fat percentage. You know that? So no. you can take somebody who's obese, yeah. have them build muscle, and you see a great protective effect uh, in, in terms of insulin. So that's, that's probably why resistance training had such a beneficial effect on the brain is because it's building muscle. And so the person can remember muscle stores glycogen, yeah. so it can burn up sugar. Um, it's also insulin sensitive. So your body's going to utilize that insulin a little bit better. Yeah. And so it's just an amazing protective mechanism. Is it better than walking? Because everyone says walking is the number one exercise. So here's why I like walking, right? I like walking because it's easy and yeah. you can inject it into your everyday life. Yeah. Um, for Anyone could do it. Right. So for example, if, if, if a client says, hey, I want to be more active. I've never worked out before and I hate exercise. What's a great way to become more active? I'll say, okay, why don't we attach activity to your normal daily routine? Mm -hmm. So you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And they'll say, yes. I'll say, okay, here's what I want you to do. 10 minute walk after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's 30 minutes a day. And it's attached to something that they already do. And it just keeps them consistent. It's easy. I don't have to change in a workout clothes, yeah. get on equipment. I can go do it. So walking's great for that. But if you compare it head to head to structured resistance training, it, it pales in comparison. It, does, it doesn't even come close. Right. And it doesn't matter what parameters you use, uh, whether it's fat loss, uh, joint mobility. Did you know that resistance training is a phenomenal way to improve flexibility? This is, this is a myth around resistance training. It makes you tired. Yeah, I was going to say, I've never heard that before because look at the size of you. Yeah. I would never think that you're very flexible. Well, okay, so let me explain. Right? No, let me explain that. <laughs> <laughs> but let me explain. So you have flexibility, mm -hmm. which is range of motion. Right, range of motion. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's just like, how far can I take my foot to my head? Right. Then you have what's called functional flexibility, which means I have this range of motion, but do I have strength and control within that range right. of motion? So to give you an example. Like a squat? Right, but let me, I'll give you an example. So like I have a, a baby, we, we have a five and a half month old at home, right? Yeah. He's very flexible. I could take his legs <laughs> and put them by his head and he can do the splits, but he's unstable. If I put load on him or had him try to do something in those <laughs> positions, he'd probably dislocate one of his joints, of course, right? In fact, that's yeah. called hypermobility. Some people have that. So you have to have strength with your flexibility. So although resistance training isn't gonna make you super flexible, what it will do is, especially when you do it properly, full range of motion with control, for most people, they'll gain flexibility because most people have very little flexibility. Right. So again, you're not gonna become a yogi, you know, a yoga expert doing it, but you'll gain flexibility, but whatever you gain, you'll have strength and control in. So it's the difference mm. between sitting in a squat and sitting in a squat and with load. Right. So like now I'm in this stretch, like imagine going into a deep static stretch and then your kid jumps on you, you'll right. tear something. Exactly. Now imagine you have control and strength in that. That's where stability comes from. That's where protect the protection comes from, from it. So for like older people, when they lose mobility, loss of mobility and they injure themselves, they'll trip and fall. That's from strength, that's from loss of strength. Right. They're, they're no longer strong. So you, you make them stronger, they improve their mobility and their functional flexibility. Now in the extreme cases of flexibility, no, resistance training is not gonna compete with uh, hardcore stretching. But for functional flexibility, being able to move, be able to have load, maybe get into a stretch but come out of it, 
resistance training is uh, is superior. Right, because I also, I mean, I know we said this already, but having more lean muscle mass on you has such benefits in terms of the metabolism and in terms of everything else. Would you say if you had to go walking or resistant training as you get old, as you age, right? Oh. Aging, would you say resistant oh, training it's, it's, for bone density? Oh my gosh, it's... Um, now this episode is brought to you by some sponsors. The first one is Organifi. Today we talked about their starter kit. This comes with seven days of red juice, green juice, so red juice, energy, green juice, chill, both good for health. It also comes with 30 days of essential magnesium and you get a shaker cup with it. Go check them out. Check out the starter, the starter kit. Go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump, get 20% off. Think about all the things that happen to us when we age, right? So we start to lose uh, bone mass, right? Right, right. So for bone density. Nothing has been, nothing directly combats osteopenia yeah. like resistance training. It, it builds muscle. Muscle anchors on bone. That bone is going to build as well. And because you're building, you're trying to build strength so much with resistance training, the bone building that comes from it is significant. It's also, resistance training is also extremely individualizable, right? So mm -hmm. if I just do walking or running, it's the same movement, the same body parts, whatever. Right. So like when you look at studies uh, of people who run, who have uh, osteopenia, they'll see some bone mass increases in the lower extremities, not much anywhere else, right? right? And that makes sense. They're running on their legs. And it's not a ton, but a little bit. If you do resistance training, well, I see they see bone mass increases everywhere and it's significantly higher. Yeah. So you have that, right? Let's talk about hormones for a second. Hormones change this as we get older. One. No form of exercise reliably raises testosterone in men, like resistance training. And women. And women. Yeah. In women, it's, it's a great balancer of right. estrogen and progesterone. Uh, so it, when those get out of balance, you start to get issues, especially when women are under a lot of stress. Right. Resistance training is one of the best forms to balance that out done appropriately. And it's probably because it's the it's it's a pro tissue form of exercise mm -hmm. versus other forms of exercise, which tend to be what, what's called maybe anti tissue. So to give you an example, if I'm doing, again, lots of cardio, the direct result of that is anti-tissue. My body is trying to reduce its muscle mass to make me more efficient at the cardio. I may also burn some body fat, but the direct result is uh, is getting rid of tissue. Okay. When I'm doing resistance training, and by the way, I want to be very clear, there's many ways to do resistance training. Right? You could, Of course, you could lift weights. You could also use machines. You could use bands. You could use body weight. Body weight yeah. in, in fact, in the book, I give three versions, three different types of workouts. One of them requires bands. One of them requires just dumbbells. And then I have one that we're using a barbell with it. Um, so with resistance training, the signal that I'm sending to my body is uh, add muscle, build muscle. It's pro tissue. Now, why is this important? Okay. Think of the hormones involved with anti-tissue, cortisol, right? Mm -hmm. It's definitely not going to be growth hormone. It's definitely not going to be testosterone. Estrogen, progesterone, not really important. I'm just trying. I'm trying to get rid of things right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Pro tissue. I want to build muscle. What do I need for that? Growth hormone, testosterone. I need a good insulin sensitivity. Uh, my my estrogen, progesterone need to balance out uh, in order for that to happen. So when you're sending this signal to your body to add this very metabolically active, healthy tissue, you're you're also simultaneously telling your body we need all these great hormones. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's right. In fact, you know, if, if someone's thinking like, is that really true? Well, yeah. If you took anybody and you, and I wouldn't recommend this, but if you injected them with these pro tissue hormones, give someone growth hormone and, and testosterone, right, right. see how they feel. They would feel incredible. Energized, younger. I mean, they've got a million different Oh my God. Things. You could go to what do they call them? Rejuvenation clinics. Yes, of and they'll course. actually prescribe these things to you. Right? Oh, so to it's huge. Different. I mean, I think I asked you that last time you were on all about the different types of like, well, maybe I didn't, I don't remember, but like even those peptides that yes. people are going or like they're doing those testosterone bullets in your butt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those little things in like yeah. for people who are aging or, you know, people are taking HGH. Yeah. But like, this is the only way, resistance training is the only way to really change the shape of your body yeah. and to elevate these natural hormones in your body. Yes, and yeah. I'm glad you said change the shape of your body. Um, you know, and I, you know, I, I'm careful when I talk in this direction because I do... I try to communicate fitness through a very positive body uh, acceptance uh, standpoint. Right. No, and, and I understand. And mainly I understand. because I, um, I've seen that be much more effective long term. Right. That being said, look, the reality is we look in the mirror, 
we see parts of our body that we want to change the shape and whatever. Right. Okay. Um, and by the way, I think it would be remiss to not be be honest. And people are working out a lot of times for vanity reasons. Oh yeah, that's the number one reason. hundred percent. Yeah. They want to look good. I mean, of course, it's great to, for health reasons, and everything else. Yes. But if we were, we, we'd be living in La La Land. Yeah. But we, I am anyway in yeah. LA. But if you didn't think that people are doing it also for for vanity. Yeah, that's too. the number one reason. Yeah. Number one reason why anybody starts exercises because they want to change the way they look. And yeah. I do talk a lot about starting that way and then transitioning it right. to I do this because I want to take care of myself. I do this Feel because, good. because that's really the only long term way to do it. Because at some point you're going to turn 70, 80, 90. Yes. And if you're so attached to your image or your looks, you're going to be in a really rude awakening at that point. Absolutely. Nonetheless, okay, we want to change the way we look and we tend to have specific parts of our body that we want to change, right? So if you ask somebody, you know, what are your goals? Oh, I want to get in shape. Yeah, but what you want, how do you want to look? Oh, I want more shape here, more shape there, more arm, whatever, right? <laughs> The only form of exercise that allows you to sculpt your body like a sculptor specifically is resistance strength. Yeah. You can't do that. So you can't spot reduce body fat, right? Right. I can't say I want to lose body fat from here, train this area. Your body burns burns body fat kind of systemically in your genetics to train right. right? But I can build muscle. I can build muscle in a very targeted way. And muscle creates shape, sculpt, tone, mm -hmm. and firmness, right? So I can look in the mirror and say, I want... You know, okay, my big my, biceps, right? Or hey, my waist isn't isn't that tight. Yeah. Um, how do I give myself the illusion of of a smaller waist? I know I'll develop my back a little right. bit. Or you know, a woman may say, you know, I want my my butt to look better. Build your butt. You don't even have to get leaner. Just building the muscle underneath will give you make your butt yeah. look better. Or I want my calves look or whatever. It's the one form of exercise that I can look in the mirror and I can literally, like a sculptor, you know, pick exercises and movements to shape and change my yeah. body the way that I want. Um, and along those lines, um, it's it's a it's a form of exercise that's so moldable. It's the only form of exercise that I could do with anybody. I don't care who you are. I, right. You could be young, old. You could be in a wheelchair. You could be injured. Um, I mean, when you go to a physical therapist, when they're rehabbing people, they use resistance training. Yeah. Why? Because it's just training with resistance in a way that builds muscle, which means, I mean, I used to train people in advanced age uh, quite a bit, actually towards the back end of, of advanced my- Advanced age? That's yeah, my favorite, right? That's such a nice way of saying it, yeah. Sal. You're such a, you're such, so PC, yeah. it's so well, cute. Well, it was uh, the back end of my career, I really enjoyed training people, uh, you know, 65 and older. And I loved it because they were, they were so wise and I used to love having conversations with them. But really the, the, big, <laughs> the big reason why was, man, it was, it was amazing to see their bodies uh, change and, yeah. and, and they were so uh, grateful or whatever. But when I would train them, I mean, Sometimes the exercise was uh, stand up and sit down. You know, that's yeah, our that's yeah. our exercise. Or just reach up as high as you can with your arm. Let's see if we can straighten it out and you're you're creating tension there. So I could I, I could totally mold it around anybody and still provide those benefits. So as you age, okay, so also with the, I guess with resistance training, you can't, you're not going to easily plateau, right? As much as you will with cardio, because you can always increase the weight and you can always do different variations more. I you imagine, can, right? but even if you do start to plateau, uh, the, the, your, your metabolism's always in this get faster mode. That's where you're pushing, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas with other forms of exercise like cardio, you're kind of pushing it to become more and more efficient. By the way, this isn't just my observation, uh, studies confirm this. You know, there was a um, there was one study. So big, I, I quote this in the book. There's a there's a a, a tribe in Tanzania uh, called the Hadza tribe, oh, yeah, and they're yeah, modern yeah. hunter gatherers. Yeah. And scientists went down there to study and see how many calories they were burning every single day, and they they predicted that these people would be burning tons of calories, right? Because they hunt their food, they forage, and they they don't sit down. They're moving all the time. Well, what they found was that they burned almost as many calories as the average Westerner in modern societies. They couldn't believe it. Right. But then they thought about it and they said, well, this makes sense. It makes no sense that as hunter gatherers, our bodies would allow us to burn 6,000 calories from movement every day because we couldn't possibly find 6,000 calories worth of food. So our bodies learn to adapt yeah. and become more and more efficient. There's another study uh, in the Amazon where they studied uh, children in rural areas mm -hmm. and then children in, in the city. And they know that the rural areas, the kids are way more active than in the city. And they want to see what the calorie burn difference was. They also found there the calorie burn was extremely similar. So just moving more, although movement has its own health benefits. Don't get me wrong. If, if you can move every day, then move every day. That's great. Right. But from a fat burning perspective, from a fat loss perspective, 
it's not gonna impact you that much. What you wanna do is you wanna figure out a way to get your metabolism to wanna burn more calories. And so when you're doing resistance training and you're doing that consistently, that's what you're constantly pushing in that yeah. direction. I mean, I've had clients where I've gotten their metabolisms to burn 500, 800 more calories a day. Um, in some extreme cases, even more than that. So just imagine, right? Like, what if you could burn 800 more calories every single day without doing really anything extra? No, I, I know. I was going to say something also, like this right now we're in a craze with um, like the Peloton, right? Everyone's yeah. like, it, like on, the, on the Peloton burning, you know, going for an hour of these classes. And I never really seen a ton of my friends do it daily. They're like obsessed. I'm obsessed. I'm a big runner. Yeah. And I'm going to use myself too as an example through the through the pandemic, right? Because you couldn't go to the gym. Yeah. And so I was, I was doing a lot of cardio as a lot of my friends were doing a lot of the Peloton. But all of us still gained weight, yeah. right? Because we were burning too much of our muscle, as you were to your yeah. point, we're eating more than we mm -hmm. normally would. Mm -hmm. And our bodies were not changing for the better. I feel like there's like such a a myth out there yes. because of all this stuff. Like they're like, oh, I'm, I'm, I was like, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna go my Peloton for an hour and I'm gonna sweat more. People think sweat is like the, um, that means if they sweat, they're working out harder. No, and that's it's a, such a myth. That's a great question. That's a great point. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's another point I make in the book is that we, if you want long term success with exercise, stop treating it like a workout and treat it more like practice. And what I mean by that is if I treat it like a workout and this, I, you know, this came to me years ago. So years ago, I was up in the, in the hills by where I live and I was hiking and then I would have runners pass me up every mm -hmm. once in a while. And as a personal trainer, it's almost impossible for me not to notice biomechanics, right? So right, people right, are running right. by and I'm like, oh my gosh, his feet are pronating. Yeah. Oh, that's an anterior. I'm like, oh my <laughs> God, that's, that that's a knee injury or, oh, you know. And then this one runner came by and just looked like a gazelle. And I thought, God, you know what the problem is? The problem is that we have this misconception that running is easy. Just go and run. Just get up and run. Right. The truth is it's a, it's a skill. And if you stop running when you were 10, like most of us, you lose that skill. Yeah. So just putting your shoes on and running for a workout is a terrible idea because when you're doing a workout, what are you training towards? Fatigue. I'm going to run until I can't run anymore. I'm going to run until... And your form goes... Anything you do to fatigue, your form goes downhill, yeah. right? Well, the way you should treat exercise is like a skill. This will give you long-term success. So rather than going to the gym and saying, I'm going uh, I'm going to work out my legs today and I'm going to get them real sore and hurt. Think to yourself, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to practice lunges, and I'm going to practice squats. I'm going to get good at this skill. Now, doing that tends to make people train much more appropriately. Yeah. Um, it's not about the sweat. It's not about the soreness. Again, it's about sending the right signal so that your body, because remember, the, the results happen not while you're working out. Right. The workout's the signal. The results happen afterwards. What did that signal promote? Well, if I train too hard... For my body, by mm -hmm. the way, this is individual, right? But if I train too hard, all my body is concerned with is healing. And so what does that look like? Well, I go to the gym, I get really sore. Yeah. Then I heal, I go back to the gym, I get really sore and I heal. And meanwhile, I never improve. It's always the same weight. It's like, yeah. Always the same exercise. My body doesn't really change. I'm just healing, recovering, healing, recovering. What you wanna do is you wanna send the signal so that your body heals, but then has room to adapt. Right. Right. Super compensate, right? So a little bit of healing, but mostly adapting. So the way you should feel after your workouts, and there's nothing wrong with sweating, but really the way you should feel after your workouts is energized. You should never leave a workout feeling like you beat the crap out of yourself. You should always feel like you have more energy coming out of it than you than, than going but, into yeah. it. Soreness, maybe a little bit or none. I, when my clients would come to me and say, oh man, I'm, I was really sore after the last workout. Oh, that was great. I would In my head, I'd say, no, we went too hard. We're going to go much easier. I liked it when my clients would say, I, I uh, kind of sore or mm, I didn't really feel it. Then I knew we hit the right dose and we would stay on that right dose. And of course, as their fitness improved, so did the intensity of the workouts and so forth. And their bodies would just progress. Well, this is the, this is the problem with weights, though, I feel like. I mean, because... You know, again, it's all psychological, you know, like, <laughs> like you feel like, like you're wasting your time. Yeah, I feel like because it doesn't give you the same endorphin. I mean, maybe for you, it does. Yeah. But most people don't get the same endorphin rush. And because if they're not sweating like an animal yeah. or like super sore, then they're like, Ugh, it's a waste of time. Right. I, they really believe that. And I'm one of even though I know in intellectually what yeah. the real answer is. That's a whole other story yeah. that you think the if you run like, an, like a dog for 30 minutes, yes. it's going to be better. But really, like. 
what I was saying to you earlier, like, but all my joints are sore. Like I can't even, you know, my ankle's sore, my yeah. knee gets is this and my hip is this. And it's actually really, that is actually aging you. Like yes. doing all that cardio, like a, a girlfriend of mine who are going for these like 10 mile walks. I mean, mm -hmm. and then they, they limp the rest of the day, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, you have to, you know, also people like us, right? Fitness yeah. fanatics, exercise. And I know the average person who's listening or watching to this is gonna roll their eyes, but to us, exercise very much can be used like a drug. Yeah, it is for it me. It is, me too, and that's what I'm saying, yeah. And so it can, I can be attached to the feeling, I can be attached to the, the action of it. So we have to check ourselves a little bit and, and, and be careful with how, how do we- How do we do that? Like, give us a practical way, because to tell me, because I haven't yet figured it out, because even though I know this to be true, tomorrow morning, I'm gonna get back on that treadmill yeah. with all my injuries, and I'll still do my little run, yeah. even though I know if I only have 30 minutes. The best approach that I've ever had is to take your laser-like focus mm -hmm. and move it into a new direction. Cause it's not gonna, if I tell you, hey, just do it this way and you know, trust the process, that's gonna be very difficult. But if I say to you, here's what I want you to do, Jen, for the next three months. For the next three months, I want, to, I, want you to, I want to see how strong you can get. I want you to focus purely on performance. Let's see what you can do with your strength. And then if you can get your mind to shift in that direction with your you know, your laser-like focus, your, right. where you want a goal and you want to hit it, and you're focusing only on performance, which probably would take you off of how you look and all that other stuff. Yeah, 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 for sure. Then you might go in the right direction. Well, I like what you said earlier, because I don't think people think about it as a skill, right? They're, they don't think working out is a skill. They think ba basketball could be a skill, tennis is a skill, but working out is a skill. And yes. you think of, if you think if you treat it like that, at your approach will be very Yeah, different. in fact, look, I'll tell you, this is what I would say to you personally, right? I would say, look, you love running. I don't want you to stop running. I don't want you to stop doing the stuff that you love. You obviously love it. No, I don't love it. Next, I hate it, actually. Oh, but okay, well. I feel like an obligation to uh, it. At this well, point. If, you, if, you, if you've got an attachment to it, I would say this. Uh, next time you run, try to run perfectly, not hard. Oh, yeah. So instead, slow down, work on your skill right. of running. And then I would say, swap out a couple of your of your cardio workouts for for... Pick two or three resistance training. That's it. Two or three resistance training exercises. Yeah, no, I do. I do that. And I would recommend that you do compound lifts and focus on strength. Go slow. Rest a minute or two in between sets. Um, and if you're uh, if you're one of those people that has a tough time resting in between sets, which I I have it. Yeah, yeah. I feel like you yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and because you need to be doing something, I would say in between read or in between read? do something. Well, yeah, something that will something that'll stimulate you. Oh, uh, okay. I can't imagine, you know what it is? I can't picture you just sitting there uh, yeah, for so two minutes waiting I'll for your I'll answer a text. That's what I mean. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna just so, stand there like, you know. Yeah, so what I, I would say like, like maybe there's some work you need to do well, I in think, between sets. Not to interrupt you, but I was gonna say, I do both. I do strength training and I do weights, but I think, I mean, and I do the, the cardio. cardio. The problem is I know I'm doing too much cardio, so yeah. I'm breaking down my muscle. Yeah. When, I, when I'm doing every, I think I think that's a lot yeah. of people. They yeah. do, a lot of people do combinations, but they're heavier on the one. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm breaking down that muscle, then I'm, when, I, when I eat, because we haven't even talked about diet yeah. and supplementing and all that, then I can't eat as much because of the not, I'm not able to burn as much with yeah. the cup. Now, and here's the other beauty with resistance training. If you bump your calories a little bit while sending that build signal with resistance training, yeah. what do you think happens? You gain, you might gain some weight, but it isn't body fat. You're gaining muscle. Now you if do that you do what? If you bump, so tell me, give me an so, example. So uh, let's say that the cornerstone of my workout yeah. is resistance training. Like, what do you do? Do you mean what you do? Uh, well, so for my routine is much more advanced. I've been working out for a long time. So I train about six days a week and it's mostly resistance training. I also throw in some functional training and then some cardio style hit workouts. You do hits, so I, yeah, that's the most so like, effective. So like Saturday, I'll do like, I'll, I'll, I'll push the sled and drag the sled and do that kind of stuff. On, How on long would you work out a day, you? Oh, typically about an hour to an hour and 20 minutes. You will, every yeah. six days a week? Six days a week. Now I've been doing this for a long time. I've been training since I was 14. Yeah. And uh, I love the performance of it or whatever. Um, it's not necessary to work out that much for health and longevity at all. But I pu I push myself but for vanity. That's okay. Health. Yeah. Okay, I got I got you for two yeah. hours a week for people who want to be healthy. Yeah. Now, if someone wants to look like that, yeah. like look like a specimen, like with right. muscles and all that right. stuff, what do you think is be real? Like be realistic. You would still have to start with the two days a week, okay. but then eventually progress yourself, and you could go really far with a four day a week workout with, with resistance training. So four days a week. Yes, yeah, so you could and, go really far with that. And talk about over exercise because then you can have the uh, just in cardio the same thing. If you can, you could uh, do too much and it have have the reverse. Effect. Absolutely. Remember, you're you're trying to send the signal, right? And it has to be an appropriate signal. Um, the right dose is perfect, right? So. 
with exercise, doing too little will give you less results. Yeah. Doing too much will give you less results. Right. And if you go too, too much, you can actually cause damage and cause yourself a lot of problems. So what's too, too much? Give, it, give us like the... It depends on the person, right? So here's a good gauge. Okay. Uh, the one, what I said earlier, how do you feel after your workout? Right. Do you feel energized? That's a good thing. How do you feel the day after? Do you feel better? That's a good thing. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Are you sore? If you are, are you sore to the touch than you went too hard? Right. Is your sleep better or is your sleep worse? Is your skin better or is your skin worse? Essentially, if you all your health parameters are improving, not just I beat myself up, but rather right. I just feel better. I feel more calm. You should have less anxiety. You should just feel, it should feel right. Now, the problem with that is if you're mentally stuck on, I want my body to change, sometimes we ignore those signals. Right, we I do. don't care if I'm beat up, if it gets me there faster. To which case I'll tell you, you won't get there faster by going too fat, too hard or too long. The right dose is the dose that'll get you there the fastest. Right. I agree with that. So then you're saying start off for people who are beginning at least two days a week yeah. and then you can move up to four or five. Don't you have to give yourself like, you know, two days, a, like you do six days. Yeah. Isn't that, a, you're, I know you're yeah. a whole different story, but two days of rest, like usually is what nor like totally. regular people say. You know, here's the thing about uh, about resistance training that's really good is that the-, the Body parts, the, you can change. And not only that, but the results are, are pretty long lasting. So what I mean yeah. by that is, if you are, if you just do tons and tons of cardio and then you stop, you'll see things change real fast in your yes. body. Yes, real fast. With resistance training, you don't. Yeah. In fact, they just did a study where they compared groups of people. And one group they had them do, uh, it was four days a week of resistance training and they did, they did it uh, 16 weeks straight, not missing a single week. The other group did three weeks on, one week off. So they actually worked out for three weeks and then took one week off every single, every, every three weeks, they took a whole week off. And they wanted to compare the results. Now, yeah. you would think the group that worked out more got better results. The truth is, at the end of the six-week week study, they were almost exactly the same. So although when they took the week off, they lost a little bit of strength, when they went back to it, it came back very quickly. This is because of something called muscle memory. Yeah. And muscle memory is a very real thing. And resistance training is what builds muscle memory. So when you build muscle, just to make it so it's not super complicated, you increase the amount of satellite cells in your muscles. Super and, complicated, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. And these, these satellite cells are responsible for many things, but, uh, but some of them can turn into new muscle tissue or they can promote muscle growth. When your muscles grow, you get more of them, but when they shrink, they don't go away. So this is, to, to give you an example, let's say it took you four years to build you know, 15 pounds of lean muscle. So for four years, you worked out hard, you trained hard, you're, you're a guy, yeah, yeah, and you yeah. gained 15 pounds of muscle. And then for whatever reason, you stop for six months and you lose it all, 15 pounds gone. And then you say, you know what? I want to get back into working out. You'll gain that 15 pounds back in about two or three months. So yeah. it took you four years before, but the second time around, it comes back much faster. Much faster. So resistance training kind of provides that, uh, that safety, uh, which is good because, again, think about the average person, Jen. Average person usually doesn't work out consistently week in and week out. They'll right. miss a week here, miss a couple weeks there. Well, you know, why not do the form of exercise that's gonna give you some kind of longer, now nothing's permanent, right? but at least results that stick around a little bit and make it easier for you to deal with the fact that you maybe stopped working out for a couple weeks. On your personal journey, when you began to shift to wellness, what was the initial step you took to healing your gut and getting back on track with the hormones? The first thing I had to do was uh, I did a food sensitivity test. Now, at the time, now keep in mind, and this is what's funny when I ever hear, when, whenever I hear people debate the wellness space, it makes me laugh because back then, so we're talking, uh, 14 years ago, maybe 13, 14 years ago, okay? Leaky gut syndrome. By the way, I had a wellness studio and I trained lots of medical doctors, great people, okay? But when I would say the word leaky gut syndrome, oh, they would laugh and scoff and oh, that's some made up, you know, crunchy wellness term or whatever. You know what they call that now? They call it intestinal wall hyperpermeability because okay? mm -hmm. now they've identified it's a real thing. So, <laughs> uh, so I did a food sensitivity test and a whole bunch of stuff came back as sensitive. So the person I worked with was like, okay, 
you've got some leaky gut issues. So for people to understand, that's when your, your gut is so inflamed that your gut wall, the cells of the wall start to space out and you start to create gaps where, you know, proteins and fragments of, of components of food pass through when they're not supposed to and your body's response to that is to produce an immune response. So you essentially start to develop intolerances, right? So on my list, the foods I couldn't eat were all the foods that I always eat, which makes sense when you have leaky gut syndrome. So she's like, okay, uh, we're dealing with leaky gut. So we need to eliminate these foods out of your diet. I'm gonna have you do a SIBO protocol because you probably have some, some overgrowth. I'm going to have you stop eating eight times a day, which is what I was doing, the old bodybuilder. Got to eat every two hours type of deal. And we're going to introduce some gaps, some fasting, not for weight loss or anything like that. I think that's a terrible approach, but rather give my gut a break. Um, so I started with that. I used, um, at the time, I used uh, cannabinoids to help with the inflammation in my gut. That was more specific to me. My workouts changed dra dramatically from the six day a week, like beat the crap out of myself to like three full body workouts a week. Was that because of cortisol? My, 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 my inflammation was so high mm. in my gut. Like, you know, exercise is a stress. And when you're dealing with chronic stress, your ability to tolerate and adapt to stress is much lower. Yeah. So now I can tolerate much more. But at that moment, it was like, we have to scale back. Your body's just overwhelmed. Yeah. So I did that. Um, and then slowly over time, my body started to get better and start to heal. And then by the end of that year, you know, I just felt so much better. With the leaky gut, do you think it has anything to do with the overeating that comes with bodybuilding? Because my husband has like the same symptoms yeah. and he has leaky gut and he has been, I mean, he was eating like 10 eggs a day yeah. for 10 years. Like, do you think that has something to do with it? Part of it, you, part of it is the the consumption and the consumption when you're stressed. So uh, what is hammered into us in the muscle building space, right? Post-workout, you got to consume the protein and the carbs to recover or whatever, which by the way, uh, the data now shows that's baloney. You know, that's only valuable in a, in a particular circumstance. Like if you're going to work out again and you need energy. But what happens when you work out for all intents and purposes, if you and I went out right now and got a hard workout and then someone did a blood test, what they would find is inflammation is higher, inflammatory, it's because it's a stress on the body. So what are we encouraging people to do? Beat yourself up, which is the bodybuilding way, and then right after, eat a bunch of food, mm. okay? So I'm introducing all this food when I'm also inflamed. It's kind of a perfect storm that encourages, you know, leaky gut. So yeah, I think it definitely plays a role. So now when you're eating, do you kind of have like a mindfulness practice to make sure you're like at a good place? Oh, let me tell you a story that's interesting around that. So do you know who Paul Cech is? No. Okay. So, oh God, you should. He's like, I thought you were going to say Paul Saladino. No, Paul Cech is like the godfather of wellness. Okay. So he's okay. been around for a while. He can be a bit out there. Very entertaining. Okay. But this guy was talking about, you know, gut dysbiosis, leaky gut. I mean, he was using the physio ball to train people in the 80s. Okay. So he's like... Uh, he's, he's, I, I refer to him as a godfather of wellness. We had him on the podcast. He's a very interesting guest, uh, to say the least. And we afterwards, we invited him for dinner. So we're having dinner at, at my, my co-host Adam's house. And they bring the food out. And when they put the food in front of him, he puts his hands like this. And then he puts his head down and he, for like 30 seconds. And then he comes up and starts eating. So I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't know Paul was religious. So I said, Paul, I didn't know you were religious. I saw you praying before you ate. And he's like, no, I'm not praying. I said, well, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm asking my body if, if, if this is the food that it wanted to nourish itself. And I listened to what my body said. And so he does this whole process. I can't remember all the details. But it dawned on me that if you look across spiritual practices, uh, you know, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, you know, all the Eastern religions, they all have a some kind of a mindfulness prayer practice before eating. Yeah. I said, oh, there's some truth there. Yeah. And, and so it's what you said. I think it has, has a lot to do with what you said is that calming the autonomic system. Obviously, there's a relationship you develop around food as well where you value it. And I'm not just shoving this in my face or eating, you know, you know, out of, uh, you know, self-hate or whatever. So yes, I do. I, now I pray personally, but I think there's a lot of value in pausing how do I feel? Is this good for me? Is this what I need right now? And then eat and then don't be distracted when I you eat.
the pause is so important. I think when people ask about intuitive eating, like how do I know when I'm full or when I'm hungry or what's going on? The pause is really helpful. I had a similar situation. I went on a girl date with a, a new friend and she prayed before we ate. And initially I was like, whoa. Yeah. Like, you know, I was really taken aback because it's kind of crazy. But she, I don't think she was praying. I think it was more of a like, spiritual slowdown moment. Yes. But I, I need to get better at that because I'm like a food shover. <laughs> yeah. I just had steak and I just ate a bunch of meat for lunch. I'm like a big meat person yeah. at the moment. Um, and I just went in on it because I get hungry. Yeah. You know, when you look at the spiritual practices, they've been around for thousands and thousands of years. So there's, whether you believe in the esoteric metaphysical aspect of it or not, there's obviously, if, especially if you look across them, there's spiritual truths. Yeah. And that's one of them. And so looking, you know, you can, we can dive into what the value of, of it is, but you mentioned things like something like intuitive eating and you mentioned you shoveling food, right? So here's an indication uh, that you are, that you have a, you don't have the optimal or best relationship with food, okay? When you're eating in that way, which we've all done, you'll find that you are not savoring the bite that's in your mouth. You're thinking about the one that's on the fork mm. or the one that's in your hand. It's not this, it's about, it's the wanting. It's not even the having. So a good practice with food is, first of all, be present. In fact, studies will show, by the way, here's an easy way to cut 10% of your calories. Anybody watching right now, you wanna cut your calories. Don't cut your calories, just do this. Don't eat with your phone or TV or any other distraction. And studies will show you'll eat 10% less naturally. Just because without even trying, you're more in tune to your body's uh, signals. Um, but that pausing, how do I feel, whatever, um, that's gonna allow you to make less or help create the space at, at least to not be so impulsive with your decisions and also to help you self-reflect. Now, the interesting thing about this is a lot of people will hear this, they'll try it and then they'll avoid it because we often don't wanna be present. Oh yeah. We often, oh, you want me to pause? Uh-uh. We wanna run away. I'm gonna run away and I'm gonna distract myself with this food. So it's not easy. Yeah. But if you do it, this is what I used to do with clients all the time. So I'd have them keep a journal because I was, I, you know, I, I uh, intuitive eating, I think the term has been, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been manipulated and it's people don't understand it fully, but this is how I would coach my clients. And one of the things I would do is I would say, okay, before you eat, write down how you feel, why you want the food, then eat. Uh, don't drink water while you eat, not because there's some weird thing about water and food, but rather it slows you down. You just end up chewing your food more and slowing down. Don't be distracted. And then after you're done, write down one or two sentences about how you feel. And there's no magic in it. There's not like, the magic was literally making them present. And what we would find is when they would do this, they, the food choices would start to change. Mm. As it, and just naturally. Um, and it was a very effective tool and, and, and one that develops these sustainable habits that lead to sustainable success versus count my calories, count my macros, don't eat this, I can't eat that, whatever. That's not a very sustainable approach. I think we should talk about weightlifting. Okay. I personally think weightlifting in terms of mental health and physical health is so empowering. Mm -hmm. For me personally, as a woman, as you said, we've, we've been marketed to be as small as possible. Yeah. With weightlifting, I felt like I had this opportunity to celebrate growth. Mm -hmm. And it made me feel really strong. I've always been a huge advocate for weightlifting. What are your thoughts on women weightlifting? It, well, first off, in 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 a time per time spent comparison, okay, it's the most effective. We have the data to support this now, finally. But you know, good coaches and trainers have known this for years. It's the most effective way to get lean. It's the most effective way to change the shape of your body because you can sculpt it. Also will balance your hormones out better than any other form of exercise. Now, let's back up for a second. Let's cover those for, for a bit. Why is it so effective at burning body fat? Trying to lose body fat by manually burning calories is a losing strategy, okay? The body is very effective at adapting its ability to burn calories because it's always trying to maintain homeostasis. It's always, it, it, it's not going to make you leaner unless it thinks it's in its best interest. And so just manually burning calories actually is quite ineffective. And I'll, I'll go into a little bit more why. Your body, we need to stop thinking of exercise as just a way to burn calories and think of it more accurately, which is exercise tells our bodies to adapt in a particular way. Lots of 
cardiovascular activity, to use an example, is telling my body to build endurance. That's the main adaptation. Side effect is I burn some calories, but I'm really just trying to build endurance. The endurance process is it doesn't require a lot of muscle or strength. And because I'm burning so many calories, my body's trying to become a more calorie efficient burning machine. So it literally pairs muscle down. This is why long distance runners who have incredible endurance and run like crazy have very little muscle on their body. Their bodies have become very efficient. This was highlighted by this groundbreaking study. Now they've done other studies to support this where researchers went and studied the uh, Hadza tribe in Northern Tanzania. This is a modern hunter gatherer tribe. So they literally live the way that we all probably lived thousands and thousands of years ago. They have no electronics, they don't even farm, they hunt and they gather. And on average, these hunter gatherers will walk or run close to 20 miles a day, okay? Whereas the average person is more like two miles a day. So very active in comparison. And the studies, excuse me, the scientists studied their metabolism. How many calories are they burning every single day? And when they got the results, and this was really good sophisticated testing, they were burning roughly the same amount of calories as the average Western couch potato, okay? So you think to yourself, how's that possible? They're moving so much, why are they burning like the same calories as my Uncle John that watches TV all day long? What's, what's going on here? From an evolutionary standpoint, it makes perfect sense. If our bodies allowed us to burn 10,000 calories a day by running and walking, we wouldn't be here. Food is very hard to come by in a hunter-gatherer society. It's very scarce. It wasn't until the agricultural revolution and so on where we were able to really pack on the calories. So our bodies adapt to that form of activity by becoming more efficient. It's really no different than like, imagine if you had an AI, super advanced AI car that modeled itself after your driving habits. Now imagine if you drove that car every single day, 300 miles going 20 miles an hour. What would that car look like? Would it look like a V10, you know, six liter engine or would it become a one cylinder engine, you know, hybrid or whatever? That's what happens to your body. So trying to move and burn your way out of, you know, uh, a body fat is a losing strategy. Your body actually pairs muscle down because muscle is very metabolically active. Muscle's expensive tissue. And since your body's like, we don't need to be strong and we need to conserve calories, let's pair this muscle down. So when you look at the studies on, Lots of cardio plus diet for weight loss. What you see is a significant amount of weight loss comes from muscle. Many studies show as much as half. Now, here's why that's a bad thing. Um, if you were to lose 10 pounds, but five of it was fat, five of it was muscle, you're smaller, same body fat percentage version of yourself. You're essentially weaker, same flabbiness. And here's the worst part. Your metabolism is slower. This is why when people go on that journey, which is what everybody does, right? I wanna lose weight, I'm gonna cut my calories and I'm gonna just run. What they find is they lose some weight, but then they plateau. So what's the next step? Cut my calories more, run some more, uh-oh, plateau again. And then they're in this unsustainable place. I'm eating 1,000 calories a day. I'm doing 60 minutes of cardio five days a week. I can't maintain this, this is crazy. In contrast, when you look at strength training, the main adaptation signal that strength training is sending is strength. We need to get stronger. So what does that do? Well, it builds some muscle. Muscle is metabolic, metabolically active. Metabolically active tissue burns more calories. You actually speed up the metabolism. But it's not just that. The process of building muscle shifts your metabolism to becoming less efficient because people may say, well, I saw a study that says that one pound of muscle only burns 12 calories. The mammalian metabolism is the second most complex thing we've identified in the universe besides the human brain. It's super, super complex. And what we found is with the same lean body mass, your body become less efficient or can become more efficient with calories. In other words, you can make your metabolism faster or slower by adjusting lifestyle and by shifting what direction you're telling your body to go and telling your body to build muscle does it. So you may be watching this as a female, you gain four pounds of muscle with good strength training. And what you'll find if you do it right is your metabolism went up five or 600 calories a day. Okay, that is 600 calories. You would have to do two hours of cardio to do that. But now you're burning that all the time. But there's more. Muscle is dense. If, you, if everybody watching right now were to lose 10 pounds of body fat and gain 10 pounds of muscle, you would weigh the same on the scale. You would look very different though. You would be smaller. Muscle takes up roughly three-fourths of the space that body fat does. So you're smaller, tighter, more sculpted, 
and you have a faster metabolism. Why do you want a faster metabolism? Look around. We're surrounded by food. Would you like to? Would you be able to? Would you like to be able to eat more and stay lean, or have to eat a lot less to stay lean? Right. So, it's also very sustainable. My favorite part about it is this, though. You mentioned growth. Okay. It's proactive tissue. So strength training and feeding myself, which we can get to because you have to do that properly. If I strength train, I am shifting my body towards proactive tissue growth. What hormone profile is, re is required for my body to build muscle? Hey, sorry to interrupt. We have a free guide titled Understanding Your Mood, Stress, and Sleep. It tackles all of those things from a health and longevity perspective. It's a totally, totally free guide. So just click on the link at the top of the description below. Balance. As a man, I need more testosterone. I need healthy levels of growth hormone. I need cortisol that's that's natural and healthy, right? Goes up in the morning, comes down towards the end of the day. For women, you have a balance of estrogen and progesterone. What you're essentially creating is that youthful hormone profile everybody's after by telling your body to build muscle. So it feels different. It feels better. It feels very healthy. We have studies now to support this. There was a study that just came out that compared strength training to cardio to strength training plus cardio. Guess which one burned the most body fat and got the best results? Strength training alone. Alone. It even outperformed slightly strength training plus cardio. Now, I don't want to people to take the message that I'm that I'm saying, don't do cardio, don't do other forms of exercise. But if you're going to exercise a few days a week and you want it to be effective, strength training by far is the most effective way to do it. And then the empowering part, this is this was something that blew me away as an early trainer. When I would train my female clients and they would get stronger, they would all say that. I feel so much more secure in my body. I feel so much more empowered. Now, as a man, that was hard for me to understand, but that's because I'm a man. And, uh, you know, that's not something that I think we don't necessarily grapple with. But I had a female client illustrate it to me very well. She came back from a business trip. She was very petite, um, CFO of a, a tech company, very successful woman. She also travel often. I started training her, and about three months into it, uh, she had to go to China. She came back, and the first thing she said to me was, she goes, Sal, I got on the plane, and I picked up my luggage, and I put it in the overhead compartment by myself. Wow. And I said, oh, okay. And she goes, no, 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 you don't understand. She goes, every time I do that, I have to ask a guy to help me. Yeah. I did that by myself. She was tiny. She was like 105 pounds. She's like, I did that myself. She goes, you know how empowering that is? And that's when it struck me, like, Okay, I get it now. Like mm. you're able bodied, you know, that feels really, really good. So it looks good, it feels good, it's pro growth. Um, it's the best way it, it is when it comes to the modern world, it's the best form of exercise uh to combat the the stresses and the ills that we all encounter. And for women, and this is the part that makes me sad, uh women have been advertised to so incorrectly and so improperly that they're the most afraid of strength training because they yep. feel like they're going to work out and then wake up tomorrow and look like Holy. their husbands or something. It's not going to happen. I promise you, it's not going to happen. Train as hard as you want. Train like a bodybuilder. You won't look like one. To me, that is the craziest comment that I see because if they knew how long and how much food that would take and how much, I mean, you'd have to dedicate your life to getting bulky if you wanted to get bulky. But I don't know how much you know about my story, but you just so eloquently put the reason I lost my weight the way I did. So I lost 90 pounds in 2017. And from the beginning, I think I had somewhat of a lucky start in the fitness industry because I had my boyfriend, now husband, Greg, who's been bodybuilding since like 14, mm -hmm. maybe even younger. And to me, he looked amazing. And because of him, I was exposed to the world of bodybuilding. So I saw, you know, Angelica who had won Miss Bikini Olympia mm -hmm. that year. And I always felt like muscle looked really feminine. I feel like when you can build your shoulders and your glutes, I loved the look of muscle. And I also felt like it's to me the best representation of hard work, especially on a woman because it is difficult to build muscle. So I was intrigued by that from the start. And I ended up losing 90 pounds, pretty much solely weightlifting. Yeah, I barely did any cardio and people are shocked by that. Yeah, it's super effective. And of course, muscle's feminine. Women have muscle. You know, what, it, what the problem is, is that there's extremes that people look at Yeah, and they're afraid that that's going to be the result. I, I, I want to I be very clear here. First off, 
the genetics required to build the amount of muscle that you see when you look in Instagram and you see a woman and you go, whoa, that's way too much muscle. And possibly drugs. Well, yes, that's part of it. But even with drugs, okay, so I could take the average female put her on a bunch of steroids and have her work out and she'll just, she'll start growing facial hair and stuff like that and she'll build muscle, but she still won't look like Miss Olympia. There is a genetic range of muscle building ability that's really no different than the genetic range for height. Mm. So let me ask you this. Walking around in the everyday world, how many times in the real world have you ever run into someone that's seven foot tall? Almost never. Almost never. You don't, in fact, if you see it, it's like, what is, it's like a UFO. Like, what am I looking at? Okay. That's, it's because it's rare. The genetics to build muscle, like you see on these bodybuilders where it's like scary looking, that's how rare those genetics are. Yeah. So like I could take all the drugs in the world and I train very hard and I would never look like Mr. Olympia. In fact, I wouldn't look like Mr. Olympia when he was 18 and he just started working out. So ladies, train you could train like a bodybuilder. You could eat like a bodybuilder. And what you'll end up getting is the body that you want. Yeah. You're never going to look like a bodybuilder. So don't worry about that. And if you did have those genetics, okay, lucky you, it means you could do way less work and get the body you want. Most people, let's say they have 10 pounds to look. Most yeah. people as, you know, in middle age or when they, you know, people who are just naturally or they, they are taking care of themselves, they are working out, they are watching what they eat. They're doing all the basics, Right. And they still have 10 pounds, five, 10 pounds. To me, that's the hardest. That's the hardest part, part to lose. That's the hardest part to focus on. I think it's easier when you have a, 30 pounds to lose, right? Because mm. And you're not doing everything right. It's for the people who are doing everything right and they still can't lose that last 10 yeah. or they've gained it because of circumstance, like just life, you know, age, whatever. What... What kind of advice or what can people do to fine tune and to to kind of tweak their lifestyle habits to lose that last five or ten? That's a pounds? really good question um, because I know uh, you know I've worked with lots of clients and that is a really frustrating position to be in because it's not like like you said like oh I got to lose thirty pounds I'm not exercising I'm eating like garbage it's like I'm doing all the stuff why and really doing the stuff yeah like not what's, lying what's about going it. on. There's two ways to look at this or two avenues you could look at uh, in terms of the solution for this. One is to work harder at what you're doing. And the other one is to work smarter at what you're doing. In this particular scenario, now if I'm talking to the average person who's not exercising, mm -hmm. it's work harder. Like, all right, get up and move, right? You're not doing right. anything. We're not talking about that person. When I'm talking about this person, the answer is almost never to work harder. They're already doing that. They're already pushing. In fact, they've probably already push that button to work harder so many times and are frustrated because they're getting minimal results. It's almost always they're not efficient enough. They're not effective enough with the time that they are spending working out or they're not effective enough with their with their diet or their sleep or there's a piece that's missing there. And it usually, it usually is their workout. Usually what they're doing with their workout is they're, they're doing more and more and more, trying to burn more and more and more calories and they're not focused enough on teaching their body to burn more calories on its own. They're not focused enough on, it's like this. It's like, okay, I'm making so much money, okay? And I'm working 60 hours a week and I want to become wealthy. Mm -hmm. Do I work 100 hours a week? Okay, now what? Now I'm stuck. How do I keep making more money? Or I could say, is there a way I could take the money that I'm making and invest it in a way so that it makes more money for me? Mm -hmm. So that's how you want to think when you're at this point. When you're at this point here where you've got that last 10 pounds, and you're doing all this work, don't think how much more can I do? Think how can I do this in a way that's much more effective? And one of the most effective possible things you could do, uh, especially when it comes to getting leaner, is to build some muscle. Build some muscle because muscle is money in, it's like, it's like, it's like invested money. It, it burns calories for you. It makes the fat loss easier because it speeds up your metabolism. So typically when I look at somebody's routine, I'll take their total workout and I'll say, okay, how much time are you devoted to workouts that don't build muscle? Let's take that away. Let's devote it more towards building muscle. Or maybe you're working out so much that your body can build muscle because you're overtraining and let's cut some of that, give your body some rest, feed you a little bit more protein and see if we can build some muscle. And then what happens is you start to get compounding effects. Okay. So Sal said, 
I'm, you know, I'm working out five days a week, but four days a week of his running, one day a week is lifting weights. He said lift the weights three days a week and only run twi- twice twice a week. It. Yeah, let me do that. Um, okay, uh, nothing's happening yet, but I'm feeling stronger. I'm feeling stronger. Oh, wait a minute. I think I'm starting to get leaner. Oh, wow, look, this is starting to accelerate. As the muscle comes on the body, you get the compounding effects of getting leaner. So in those cases, it's almost, and that's just one example. I, and I gave you an example that's the most common, I would say. But in, in most cases, it's I, I'll look at someone's workout and they're either doing too much or they're doing the wrong kind of workouts. Um, and then in which case, I'll either scale it back or change their workouts to make them more efficient. More time efficient. More efficient. But that goes back to the whole thing that you said earlier, right? Like you're going to do the thing you like the most and the things yeah. you don't like, you're not going to want to do. So it's about quality of life too, right? Yes. Like if someone's someone who doesn't love to lift heavy weight yeah. and they really love tennis and dancing and cardio, yeah. right? They're going to go do that. So it's better to do that than to something that you – app or to, than versus doing nothing. Well, you're you're what you're talking about I think is – is the best answer, which is, you know, what, what, we get this question sometimes where it's like, um, you know, I've, I, uh, I haven't found a career that I love or how do I, cause you know, people will say, oh, you guys love what you do so much. Like the key is to, to, to do what you love. That way you never work a day in your life. No, no, no. The key is to learn how to love what you do. That's the key. Like if you can do that, then you're, then you're doing great. So in this particular example, okay, I want to lose this last 10 pounds, but I love dance and that's how I work out. And Sal says I need to lift more weights, but I don't want to lift more weights. I like to do dance. Learn to love your body the way it is. You know, it's the, you know, I want my cake and eat it too type of deal. Like I get that. I get that we want everything, but I think many times, and again, especially in this category of people that we're talking about, because I think fitness fanatics in this category can be especially harsh with their Mm self-criticisms. Many times, I can't tell you how many times, Jen, people are like, oh, I can't lose that extra 10 pounds. And I look at them and I'm like, you look amazing. I I don't think you see what other people see. I think you might be a little harsh on yourself. Like learn to love and accept the body that you have and learn to love and accept the, the way that you enjoy working out. And okay, so you don't have an extra quarter inch on your arms if you're a guy or you don't have that Fine, you're not, you know, 15% body fat, but maybe you're, you know, 17%, but you're doing all this amazing stuff. Like, you know, I think it's probably better long-term for long-term happiness, which is, I mean, what else could you possibly want but that, right? To just be happy with with what you're doing and and the way you look. Easier said than done, speaking. Like, look at you, right? Like, we, you're- uh, You know why I shake my head when you say that? Yeah. Let me ask you this. You're in the fitness space. Okay. You know our space very well. Some of the most fit looking, ripped people, you probably find some of the hardest, most challenging body image issues. I want to say that that's why I'm asking these questions for a friend. No, (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Uh, No, because I feel like we are the hardest and most critical, you know, like because because you've been you're you've trained so much that you notice every nuance and see every imperfection. But most people aren't in the category of fanatical fitness people, right? Where it's like you and I, where we do it a lot. We've been doing it for our whole life. And so we notice we notice this 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 nook, this cranny, how this can be better, how this. I'm talking about people who maybe not at that level, even maybe maybe above average in like in yeah. like activity, who are struggling, who are doing all the weightlifting and who are doing all those things and still not getting a result that they want. Yeah. How much of it is not training just on nutrition? Are there like key factors yeah. people should be focusing on that that they're not be, like I I'm a big like you, I believe in protein is super important for building be, building muscle. What's your take on uh, protein that's not animal protein, and right. what some key tricks that people can do on the on the nutrition side that can help with fat loss? You know, okay, so nutrition's a great topic uh, because it's by far the most nuanced. And that's got the, hot, the the greatest degree of individual variance. And here's why. First off, now there are some general truths with diet. So I don't want to be like, it's all up in the air. No, no, there's some general truths and we'll get to those. But when we're talking about nutrition and diet, let's 
let's ex- let's let's kind of dive into why it's so nuanced and such and there's such a massive individual variance. Well, number one, um, biologically, we're all very different. I have a microbiome that's quite unique to my body. Physiologically, I don't necessarily react and respond to food the same way as the next person. Like what something. Do you mean? So I may eat something that maybe maybe affects my digestion poorly, oh, whereas for them it feels okay, or maybe it causes a spike in insulin with me, but to the next person maybe not so much. Maybe a food gives me a little bit more energy, gives them a little less energy. This one makes me a little more full. Maybe for this other person it doesn't work so well for satiety. So there's all that. But then let's add in a huge factor, which is the psychological effects and attachments and connections to food. Like – what is food? Yeah, it's proteins, fats, carbs, and calories. Is that all it, that, that food is? Like, no. What's w- the, the top 10 reasons why people eat have nothing to do with fueling their body with proteins, fats, and carbs. It has usually to do with enjoyment, uh, celebration, mourning, anxiety, emotional. stress, boredom, emotional. Boredom's a big one. Yes. Uh, it could be, um, I eat this food because traditionally this is what I ate when I was a kid and I have attachment to this particular thing or I don't like that because one time I got sick and now I don't like it anymore with, when I eat that or whatever, right? Yeah. So food is extremely complex when you, when you connect it to the person, mm-hmm. okay? And you have to consider that when you're trying to talk about what's going to work best for me, what's going to be the best diet for me? Now I can talk about what studies say. It's true that protein is the, the produces the most satiety in the body, meaning it'll fill you up the, the fastest and keep you full the longest. So it's really good for maintaining your calories. Protein is essential, meaning you have to consume it. You, your body can't make essential amino acids. You have to eat them. Fat is also essential, um, meaning there's certain essential fatty acids you have to consume. Otherwise you won't Thr- you'll fail to thrive. Carbohydrates, not essential. You don't, you never have to eat a single carbohydrate. That doesn't mean that's ideal though. Uh, carbohydrates, uh, need to be consumed by a lot of people to have an ideal diet to give them the best energy and the best feel and that stuff. Um, you don't want to overeat. That's a general rule. Eating too much of anything is bad for you. Um, in fact, eating the right amount negates many of the negative effects of certain foods. So like sugar, If your calories are low, sugar doesn't have as bad of an effect, not nearly as bad of an effect uh, on the body. Same thing with certain fats. Um, You want to eat in a way to where you have, you develop a good relationship with food. Like that's a general truth. Like if you're constantly reaching for food to blunt uh, emotions or if you're using food like a drug, okay, Um, or if you eat uh, mindlessly, or without presence, that can be an issue, right? And studies will show this. Like mm-hmm. if you eat food in front of the TV or in front of your phone, you'll consume like 10 to 15% more calories. Absolutely. Just on average. It's also habitual, right? Because you're used to eating this at that time. You're used to eating this when you watch TV. It's like changing those habits. Yes. Are you, this this is going to fly in. The, I think this is this might be controversial, but it's, I'll back it up. It's, I think it's very true. Your body knows how to eat healthy. It knows how to eat in a balanced, healthy way. The problem is we're so disconnected from our bodies and we're so disconnected from understanding all of the values of food from an awareness standpoint that we don't know how to listen to those signals. So the path to healthy eating is starts with education, proteins, fats, carbs, calories, what, right. what's, what's the right amount for my body, from this cognitive standpoint, what's the right amount of protein? What fo- and then and then from there it's awareness. What foods make me feel good? Th- which ones give me the best digestion? Which ones affect my skin the best? Which ones make me feel good? Which ones make me feel bad? Which ones do I reach for when I'm anxious, sad, or stressed? What foods are hard for me to stop eating? Right? Um, like bring awareness around that stuff. And then you can start to develop a more intuitive style of eating where, um, like for me, for example, I crave well-cooked vegetables when my digestion is off. Like I, I crave them. And I didn't start that way. It started with me becoming aware of my digestion's off. If I eat well-cooked vegetables, it tends to fix my digestion. And so I started doing that. And then eventually I developed this behavior where that's what I want. When my digestion is off, yeah, right, yeah. Um, so, so that's kind of the path towards sustainable, long-term, healthy eating. And I will add one thing: 
if you're looking for a body that looks good, you know, quote unquote looks good, just try to be healthy because chasing health results in a body that looks healthy and that usually looks good. If you chase looking good, you'll oftentimes sacrifice your health, in which case then you stop, you stop looking good. And you can see this with people who are body obsessed. At some point, like they can't take enough substances, they can't do enough plastic surgeries and everything starts to fall apart or their health goes poorly and then forget all the looks. So it's really a good North star, right? It's a good guiding uh, principle. It's like, okay, how do I optimize my health with my food? What does that mean? I feel good. I feel uh, healthy. I've got good digestion. Um, I sleep well. My skin feels good. I have good energy. Like if you kind of aim towards that, that'll point you in the right direction most of the time versus what's going to make me look ripped? What's going to make me look good? Because that oftentimes that, you know, that body obsession tends to lead us towards sacrificing our health. And then we end up with nothing. Well, then how I, yeah, I agree with that. I think I love that saying that you say though. That's great. When you chase health, you, you, that you chase health, don't chase aesthetics. Uh, yeah. Aesthetics. And then the rest will follow kind of thing. It does. It's it does. so true. Yeah. It was just, um, you know, it's, a, you know, that, you know, that really, really hit me as a, as it, well, it hit me as a trainer because I was always a better trainer to my clients than I was to myself. So I was really good with this with my clients before I really figured this out for me. Really? Right? Yeah. Well, yeah, because I mean, this is, I think most people, right? You, like, like, you know, talk to therapists, right? They're like really good with their patients and they have, and then they issues. have the, the most screwed up people ever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so, like, you know, it's, it's so true though, right? Like yeah. whatever you're teaching is usually you're, you're bad at it yourself. Yeah. It's something you're working on yourself. Yeah. yeah. So I was that's really good. That's why a lot of trainers become trainers, by the way. And that's totally. why a lot of people get into the fitness business. Totally. To your point. hundred percent. Right? So I was really good with my clients with this and it just dawned on me. It's like, oh my God, like when I get my clients to really want to be healthy, they get all the results they want and then they stick. The results stick because they're valuing the health rather than the just the appearance. It also dawned on me when you look at like studies on why we consider certain things attractive. Like why do we consider healthy skin attractive? Why is there a hip to waist ratio that we tend to universally find attractive? Why do we find a, a shoulder to waist ratio in men that's attractive? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, why is muscle more attractive than no muscle? Um, why is a certain body fat percentage considered attractive versus too little body fat or too much body fat? It's because it's all reflective of health. Evolutionarily speaking, if you saw somebody, like these are the yeah. signals that you would get to tell you this person is healthy, is vibrant, is fertile. I want to mate with them or whatever. Um, you know, so they're just reflections of health. Now we've perverted them all. <laughs> through, you know, plastic surgeries and, it's, and you know, drugs it's, and stuff like that. It's on such a rise. You know that you can't even, it's a rise like what, 10,000% plastic surgery, just based on the fact that I think even since COVID, because so many people are more obsessive, are obsessing on how they look because all they were doing was looking at Zooms of themselves and social media and the filters. Sad. So now people want to look like the filters. And if they don't look like the filter, they think they're ugly. It's it makes me sad. I mean, I have kids, you know. Uh, and, uh, yeah. And it makes me sad because they're growing up in this in this world. And I suffered from body dysmorphia. You know, like I said, that's why I started working out. Do you think you still suffer from it? Oh yeah, I don't think you get rid of it. Um, I think you get better with it. I still. I'm, I'm pretty sure I don't see myself the way that maybe other people do. Yeah, because you visually. always sound super surprised when I say, oh my God, you look so ripped, you're uh, so big, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you're like, what do you mean? Like, you are one of these people that we're talking about. I, I 100%. Um, it's definitely something that I don't, I wouldn't say I struggle with uh, anymore, but it's there. I, I'm, I'm aware of it, right? You I'm think aware. about it. Well, I'm just aware. I'm do aware. Do you think you look good? Um, I think I'm comfortable I'm very comfortable in my skin. So do I judge the way I look and say I look good or look bad? If I go down that road, I think I could definitely, that the body dysmorphia will definitely rear its head if I start to go down that. So it's just more about being comfortable in my own skin, I guess. But like if you take your shirt off in the mirror, are yeah. you looking for every imperfection? I used to. Um, now, no, not really so much. Um, I don't study myself like I used to. You know, when I was a kid, it's like you look in the mirror, like, yeah. is this changing? Is that changing? What's this look like? What's that look like? 
Not not really, not anymore. Not studying it, but like, are you still like, you know, in your own, off of a podcast, let's say, or like in your own home, are you ever like, oh shit, like I have a little bit on my love hand. Oh my God, I had this happen. Like I'm doing it. Like, are you hard on yourself? Don't I, you lie. Know, Don't you know, lie. No, that's a good question. No, no, no. I'm think, let me think about that for a second. Huh. I think um, I can be. I'm sure I can be. I haven't been in a while, but I've been on a pretty good roll. So it's hard to say. I haven't had any like situations where I haven't been able to work out for a long period of time and something like, you know, or. So when you're consistently, uh, habitually doing what you're supposed to, you feel good. Yeah, I do. But I'm not sure which one comes first. I think part of it is this the mental. I, okay. So I, this hundred percent will identify. It's an exercise very much therapeutic for me, for sure. If I didn't exercise, I'd be tough, a tough person to, to, to be around. Me too. Yeah. So it's definitely very therapeutic for me. Um, I, you know, I know, I, I know it's there. Um, but I think I'm better with it. I know I'm better with it. I'm definitely comfortable with my skin because I identify more, less with my body and more with like what I do here on the podcast with being a father and a husband, you know, what would bother me the most would be loss of function. In other words, if I felt uh, weak or if I felt like I couldn't do what I could do before, that would bother me more now than how I looked. And I think it's because I know what that means. Like, oh my God, I can't do that thing anymore. What if I can't play with my kids? Or what if I, um, but look, here's the deal, Jen. I'm gonna have to deal with that at some point. I can't, you know, we all get older. If I'm, well, I should say, if I'm blessed to continue to get older, yeah. I'm gonna have to deal with that as well. So it's gonna be like, it's look, it's a constant game of acceptance. Always, a constant, it never stops. I, I, I was gonna say, it's like the, also the, the when you know what you had, and then you see it, you see yourself losing <laughs> yeah. it. You're like, what is going on here? And, and then it becomes like this, you're chasing youth. You're chasing perfection when you can't fleeting. chase time. It's fleeting. You can't, you can't stop the clock, right? So like this whole idea of longevity and biohacking your way to like youthfulness, what is your take on it? Like, do you think it's become, it's such an, it's become so extreme as long as it's coming from a healthy place. It's not. Let's be honest. Yeah, that's the thing. I no think, one's doing it out of a healthy place. People are trying to like slow down the clock and stop the aging process. Yeah, if it's if it's out of rejecting the aging process, um, I'm then just I think being that's real. A, I think that's a problem. I agree with you. I think if it's like, oh, like this is, you know, going to help maintain my mobility, my independence, improve my quality of life. But come on, that's how okay. many people are really doing it for those reasons? They're not. I mean, you I know that. You think Ben Greenfeld's doing it because he wants to have more mobility when he's 80? I don't think so. I, I know in our space, especially, I mean, I know in fitness in particular, not just health, but fitness in particular, um, the vast majority of people are doing it because they want to look good. Right. And, and because they're they're trying to, you Stop know, fill a hole, right? Or there's an emptiness. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to find it. You ain't going to find it until you learn to accept the, you know, yourself and accept, uh, I guess, reality, you know, so uh, it's it's just not going to happen. It's if you use fitness in that way, fitness can become very dysfunctional. Well, also, does the do these quick fixes or whatever you want to call them actually work? I mean, I don't know. I have the red light at my house. I have a, a sauna yeah. at my house. I have a cold plunge at my house. My house looks like a wellness spa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And I'm sure like, you know, with you're the peptide and the testosterone and the supplements. I mean, at, at what, like, how much of this stuff is stuff that basically costs a lot of money and keeps, basically, it's making the economy yeah. trillions of dollars, right? Because we're, we're everyone's chasing youth. Yeah, look, if you looked at a pie, of a, you know, the pie represented 100, all that stuff is like 1% or 2%. That's the truth. Right. All the 99% is uh, your exercise, mindset, sleep, and diet. Now- the question should be, how much of a difference can exercise, diet, sleep, and mindset make Big. in your life? Profound. Profound. It's the most powerful antidepressant known to man. It's the most, totally. this is by data, facts, okay? It's the most powerful anxiolytic, right? Anti-anxiety known to man. It is a vehicle for personal growth. If you follow it and you do it the right for the right reasons, you learn acceptance, you learn discipline, you learn about uh, the value of work and effort, 
acceptance because you accept your body for what it is because you, you ain't going to keep going forever if you, you – you know, once you realize you ain't going to look like your favorite model, well, you keep going anyway and you accept that you, you're your own person. So it has profound effects, but m- more so because it's, a, it's that journey that you're on um, and it can have those profound effects. All that other stuff is cool and it can be fun, but it's so small. Now, the question is, well, why is it talked about all the time? Because they could sell that. Yeah, of course. It's like it's actually something that they can, they can the funnel can send you there. They can monetize, or they it. can monetize yeah. it. This is the thing. What's what works isn't sexy, you know. At the end of the day, the things that work are the still the basics. Yes, it's exercise, move more, sleep more, eat better. Like these things, and these things have no price tag on it. No, it's they're it, free. No, and it's literally, and the data is very clear on this: it's proper exercise, good diet, good sleep good spiritual practice. I want to include that because a spiritual practice has been shown to be profoundly impactful on mental health and longevity. Okay. It's also shown and success of life, success of marriage, success as a parent, uh, just, just overall. Um, and then, you know, you could throw a mindset in there. I think would you, you, you could probably throw in there, but that's like it right there. Uh, I know that sounds like, Oh, that's it. Well, that, that's a lot. And community I think too is in there too. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. You Your relationships. That, thank you. Or community, like peeping people around you. Like that's why have you, you know about the blue zones, right? Yeah, I do. And the people who live the longest are the ones who have like the deepest communities around them. And honestly, walking was the most most important, best exercise by a landslide. I agree. I think walking's uh, for for a few different reasons. One, most people can still walk, and that means that they can they, there's they don't have to like learn the technique and skill of it. So the injury rate is low. It's easy. It's convenient, um, and uh, as a result, it's one of those things that people can do on a very consistent basis. So no, walking is number is actually one of the best forms of exercise for those reasons. And if you add, add something else to it, strength training, and then you've got- And then you've got, and then you're good. But yeah. yet people don't want to hear that. So that's why then, that's why a lot of these, like these uh, salesmen, you know, biohackers sell a shit ton and make a bazillion dollars because they can't, they can't make money off of go walk outside or, you no. know, like go, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't sell. People don't, and I guess, I guess my question is what is behind the psychology of, we all know psychologically and intuitively what works, and yet we're still able to be tricked and or manipulated. We want to be we, tricked. We, I know. We we want to we allow the manipulation. Like I know, like we're having this conversation, yeah. right? About what really works. And like you and I have done it all, we know it all. And at the same time, I'm a sucker. I'll go get that red light. Yeah. I'll go do that, Cole. I'll go do all these things. Like why do we why do we still behave and and go down that those rabbit holes and those paths even if we know better? Yeah, well you're 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 an aficionado, right, with health and fitness. So for you it's probably more fun to try different things. Yeah, besides that. that same like for me also. I think for the average person they want to be lied to. They want to believe that their answer is in a drug or a device or a special diet. Um, you know, where they just don't eat this one thing or just eat this thing. They want to believe it. Um, and they uh, want to be fooled, you know, people that, because the other, the other option requires work uh, time, right? It takes work and time. Now here's the myth. Here's the lie. Here's the big lie, right? The big lie is doing it the right way is hard. That's not, that's not correct. Doing it the wrong way is harder. Now, you might think it's not harder to sit on your couch, not move, or to eat whatever you want, or to take some pills or whatever, but the truth is it's harder and you'll see. You'll see how much harder it is to have poor health. You'll see how much harder it is to not do that work. Right. So the, They it's say a, choose your hard. It's a myth. It's totally a myth. And the, the, the truth is it's cheaper and easier to do things the right way. It just takes per people willing to be uncomfortable willing to grow and to change because growth and change come from being uncomfortable. That's all it takes. It takes that. So you have to be willing to do that. And then when you do it and you do it consistently and you do it long enough and you go on this journey, you start to just gain all these tremendous, incredible uh, benefits. But you can't, I mean, I think people just, they want to believe in the lies because they don't want to take that step. They also want to take the responsibility. I think it's, it's, you know, 
it's like I could, somebody could sit there and say, wow, it's my fault. It's my fault that I'm unhealthy. Or they can be like, it's not my fault. It's my genetics. Or I just am not taking the right supplement. Or, oh, it's this thing that I'm not doing. I got to go do this, you know, shine this light on me and that'll make it happen. That'll make it, that'll, that'll like lean me out. It'll improve my metabolism. Yeah. What do you think of, um, how much of it you think is genetics? How much of it, how much can you trick your baseline? So when you think of genetics, think of it this way. Think of a wide range of potential. Okay. So like from, let's say zero to a hundred, your lifestyle determines where you fall on that scale. Your genetics determine where that scale is. So like LeBron James. Okay. Let's say, uh, uh for basketball skill, the scale is uh, zero to a thousand. Okay. He was probably born with like 700 to 1,000 was his range. And mine's somewhere like 100 to 300. I was going to okay? say 10. <laughs> right? Or maybe whatever, right? Well, yeah. I can get as good as 300 with hard work and effort, and he can be as bad as 500 or whatever with doing no work and no effort. So yes, you have your genetics, but you also have this range that you can work within, and that's what your lifestyle does, you know, helps determine. Now, my question to people who ask that is, who cares? What are you going to do now? Okay, you got your genetics uh, mean that you can't be super ripped or you're not going to be the strongest or the fastest person. Okay. Like that's what you got. Yeah. What are you going to do now? Right. That's what, that's the, that's the cards that were dealt to you. Yeah. How are you going to, how are you going to play the, that, play that hand that's as it. best you can? That's it. Now it's up to you. Now you got your potential. Go work with your potential. And I'm going to tell you something right now. Hard work, discipline, effort, and growth it usually trumps genetics and talent, okay? And I'm not talking about the extremes. Yes, there's people who are like so talented, it's ridiculous. But I know way more super talented losers than, uh, you know, I know a lot of those people. And I know people who are like not very talented, but through growth, effort, and work, made a lot out of themselves. Yeah, you sound like me. This is literally my book, by the way. I say that all the time, that... I I know so many super smart dumbasses out yeah. there who are doing nothing. Yeah. And I know a bunch of dumbos who are like living the high life, having the best time, being super successful and, and have everything they ever wanted. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't believe I don't believe that you should just like fall on that as your excuse for life of like why this is this is the why. No, you know? that's a shitty way to live, man. It's a it's a it's a sad, shitty way to live. And, and you know, look, you, Again, your choices are accept what you can't change and focus on what you can't or dwell on the stuff that you can't change. That's a prison. Why would you want to be stuck there? Look, you know, read books on POWs or people who've been through some really mm -hmm. challenging things. Read, you know, uh, there's some really, really good stuff out there and you'll read age old philosophies on this. Stoicism talks about this um, mm -hmm. as well. It's like, it, it's like, even if even if the result were the same, even if the end result were the same versus with person A who focuses on the stuff that they can't change versus person B who focuses on what they can't change, the person who focuses on what they can change will feel different and better because they feel like they have some autonomy, like they have some control. So regardless, across the board, it's a better choice. Now, I don't believe they'll end up in the same place at all. I think we have so much evidence to show that if you focus on the things that you you can change and ignore the stuff that you can't, you're going to turn out much better. The evidence is clear on that, but even if it wasn't, it's like you're going to feel you're just going to feel much better. So, and that's the, that's the, that's the road to success in anything. It's definitely the road to success in fitness. I could tell you right now, meeting with someone, if someone's going to have the right attitude for long term fitness success versus failure, and it's the difference between the person who comes to me is like. Everybody's overweight in my family. There's nothing I can do. It's my genetics. I just like food too much. This sucks. I hate exercise. Versus the person that's like, hey, you know, what can what can I do? Let me try some different things. I'm willing to learn. I want to I want to try making some changes. I you know, I'm gonna focus on the stuff I I can I can change and, and the stuff I can control. Like that person's gonna do well. But when you walk around and you see that, there's a lot of uh body image and just 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 dysphoria. It's so true. I, I mean, <sighs> when you were talking about it before the leaner I got on my fitness journey, the more insecure I got yeah. and the more ab checks I did and the more obsessive. I mean, I never had a bad relationship with food particularly. And I feel lucky to have said that. 
But the worst my relationship ever was with food was at the peak of my fitness journey yeah. when I had a six pack and I felt really good about myself, quote unquote. I couldn't even go on a vacation because I was so obsessed with everything. Have you seen the data on when people are the most, when they have the best body acceptance or satisfaction? What age? Ooh, 25? When they're in their 60s. No. That just goes to show you how much of it is wow. uh, how you actually look versus how you actually think about yourself and care about yourself. When people have the greatest body acceptance is right around then. It's not. That's actually the worst. In their 20s is when people have the worst. Wow. Body acceptance. You know what's crazy? I just had Mark and Carrie Sisson on mm. from Primal uh, Kitchen. Okay. 68 and 70. Yeah. Like glowing, <laughs> feeling themselves. Yeah. They were like, we're having the best sex we've ever had. And I was yeah. like, whoa, okay. Yeah, yeah. But like, that's pretty cool. And yeah. that adds some perspective, I feel like. It does. And I, you know, what we've done in, um, in our marketing spaces, in our media, is we've taken signs of vitality and attractiveness and we've amplified them so much and distorted them so much that we believe those to be like the be all end all. And so for example, um, you know, you can look at like, like a muscular body. Okay, let's talk about a man, right? So wide shoulders, small waist, muscular body. That shows healthy testosterone, it shows mobility, it shows functionality. But then we take it to the extreme and you could be a 280 pound shredded bodybuilder, which most women would look at and go, oh, that's a little, that's a little excessive, right? What's attractive is health. Healthy is attractive. By the way, media, when I'm looking at a picture, I don't see the person's personality. I don't feel their vibe. I don't see anything else but how they look. I don't need to say this, but you've, we've all met people and you meet them and they're attractive. Why are they attractive? It's not just how they look. They're vi they have vitality, their personality, their energy, their, their, their mind. Um, and we don't talk about this enough and it, it affects a lot, especially young girls. I have a 14 year old daughter and it, you know, it affects her too. And to the point where I can see it now, she's at the age, right? Where she's overemphasizing her appearance because she thinks this is the most important thing. And I'm trying to tell her like, this is not. Yeah. And it's fleeting anyway. I can't imagine being a 14 year old girl with TikTok now because oh. it makes me feel bad about myself. I can't even imagine. Yeah, that's a that's a, um, a health practice actually, is I, I, I try to communicate to people to change the algorithm on their social media because in just by you have to consciously like and comment on stuff that you know is going to be good for you because your brain doesn't know that you're looking at people on social media it thinks this is what you're surrounded by so we naturally compare ourselves to what we see around us so if you're looking at edited photoshopped orthorexic body obsessed people you'll develop this without realizing it like oh man i am nowhere near all these people and I look terrible and I am way down the ranks on this type of thing, you know, on, on appearance or attractiveness when it's not actually true. I said it earlier, there's more people with more people who are millionaires than there are people with six packs. I, I manage gyms for a living. So that's already a self-selection bias. There were not very many people with six packs, very rare. And that's a gym. Yeah. So what you see on social media is walk around the real world and then you'll see for yourself. Like literally just walk around and even, you'll see. Even in the health industry, Greg and I are on phone calls with people all day long in this space. None of them are in shape. Yeah. It's pretty wild. Yeah, yeah. So it's health that's attractive. And, and if you chase the aesthetics, you'll lose your health and you'll lose your aesthetics. You're not gonna have them when you lose your health. If you chase the health, you'll get a great deal of both. And it's that vitality and health that's attractive. And it's much more than just your appearance. So. For someone listening, mm -hmm. and by the way, my audience is like 99.9% .9 women. Awesome. Obviously. High to the 0.1% <laughs> of men, if you're listening. Actually, maybe because of you, they will be listening. Yeah. But for anyone listening who wants to start weightlifting, gaining muscle, but wants to stay lean and maybe even lose weight, yeah. what would you recommend taking as the first step? Okay, so um, the building muscle process uh, does require that you feed yourself to fuel the process. So think of it this way. Earlier I said... What people typically do is they'll cut their calories, add cardio, lose some weight, plateau, then they have to do it again, plateau, and then they end up in this like unsustainable place, which I'm sure everybody can identify with. We've all done that. Here's how it looks if you do it the right way, okay? If you start out and your goal is to build strength and build muscle, actually even forget the build muscle part, get stronger. I like that better because it's not so tied to aesthetics. And if you're getting stronger, you're moving in the right direction. So it's like, I need to get stronger. So I have to feed myself appropriately to do that as well. So aim for 
your target body weight in grams of protein. So wherever you feel your target body weight is, let's say it's 120 pounds, 150 pounds, whatever, that's how many grams of protein I'm going to aim for and prioritize. In other words, in my meals, I'm going to eat that first and then I'll eat everything else. Now, the reason why we're going to do that is there's two main reasons. One, protein fuels the muscle, which is going to speed up your metabolism, which is going to make it much easier for you to get lean. That's number one. Number two, protein is very, very satiety producing in comparison to carbohydrates and fats. If you eat your, and you'll find this, people watching, it is very tough from Whole Foods, eat your target body weight and protein, you will find, oh my God, I don't think I can eat anymore. Because yeah. it just really kicks in those satiety signals, okay? So naturally what'll happen, if it's all whole food, you'll naturally eat an appropriate amount of calories. So protein, strength train, the strength training should look like, first of all, it should be appropriate for your current fitness level. For beginners, you're probably going to start twice a week. You're going to do maybe three or four compound exercises. These are kind of full body exercises like squat, deadlift, press, row, that type of thing. And treat the workout appropriately, meaning exercises, the goal of the exercise isn't to make you sore or sweat shift your mindset. The goal of the exercise is to learn the skill of the exercise. So I'm not going into the gym to do squats so I can feel my legs shake. I'm going to try and get good at the skill of squatting. That is going to pay you back so much more because it is a skill and the better you get at it, the more you get out of it. Like if you could squat with really good technique and form, you'll get 10 times the results than if you just squat hard with terrible technique and terrible form. So go to the gym, Practice the skills of these exercises. So do them to get better at doing them. And that will also help dictate the right intensity. At a lighter weight, how do, you, how do we know when we're lifting enough? If your technique is, if you're trying to perfect the skill, you will pick the right weight. So people are like, well, that's going to be too light. No. When you first get started, it's, it's appropriate, believe me. Yeah. As you get stronger, you're going to want to add a little weight to challenge yourself a little more. But don't compromise the fact that you're getting better at the skill. Getting better, by the way, also means you can lift more. It also means you can go a little deeper. It means yeah. you have better control. So a good rule of thumb with that is I'm going to do this. It's going to feel challenging, but I'm going to perfect the skill of it. Now, when you become more advanced and you're, you have a little bit of a better grasp of intensity, the ideal intensity is about two or three repetitions short of failure. So failure, the way that we talk about it or define it is you lift until you know that you can't do another rep with good form. So you know, if I do another rep, my form's gonna break, okay? Don't go that hard, stop two reps before that. That's, uh, that intensity is gonna give you the best results in the long term. Uh, just end of story, it's gonna give you the best results. So if you start like that, hit those protein targets, and then just try to get stronger. Just try to, try to get stronger. And then what will happen is the scale will look like this. It's going to start off slow, but then you're going to get a faster metabolism and it starts to snowball. Okay, you start to get this snowball effect. So rather than initial weight loss happening and then plateauing and then it's like, what the heck? It's like, okay, nothing's happening. I kind of feel better. Oh, well, I look leaner, but the scale isn't moving. And then all of a sudden, things start to, to speed up. And then what you'll find, if you do this right, is you should be able to eat as much or more after you lose 30 pounds than you did when you first started. What a great place that is, right? That you could eat more, but be leaner. Very sustainable, much more sustainable. Do you recommend people track on like a MyFitnessPal from the beginning? That's what I did and I feel like I learned a lot and then I let go of it. One thing that you said, which I would have asked you, mm. if you had asked me, Sal, should I track? I would have asked you, do you have any challenges or issues with your relationship to food? You said you didn't, in which case tracking's fine. If you're listening to this right now and you've had challenges with food, you've had dysfunctional eating patterns, maybe you've you've dabbled in anorexia or you've restricted yourself or whatever, tracking can be a really bad trigger because it can seem very controlling and it could cause a lot of stress and it can cause a lot of problems, okay? So if that's you, don't track. Now, if you eat whole natural foods and you avoid heavily processed foods, let's get into that for a second. Why do we want to avoid heavily processed foods. Well, generally they're not as healthy, but that's not really the main reason why because you could they could process foods to have all the nutrients and stuff from other foods. And we can argue about whether or not that's healthy or not, but really what it is is that ultra processed foods are engineered to make you overeat. And they're very effective at doing so. The, the best 
nutrition studies we have, hands down, are these controlled studies where they take groups of people, they put them in a lab, and they say, you are you can eat as much as you want of these foods, and you can eat as much as you want of these foods. And the difference is, these are heavily processed foods, and these are whole natural foods. And they leave them alone. And then they take those groups and they switch rooms, okay? And they've repeated this study. And what they found is, on average, you'll eat about 600 more calories a day with the heavily processed foods because they engineered them to make you overeat. This is what they do. It's to make them irresistible. This is why if you put a family size bag of Lay's potato chips in front of me and you told me to eat it in 30 minutes and you'd give me 10 grand to do so, I could do it. But if you gave me five plain boiled potatoes, I wouldn't. Yeah. It's the same potatoes. It's the same amount. But the plain one, I'm going to gag after eating the third one, right? The processed ones, they've been engineered and I can, I can get through that. So if you avoid heavily processed foods, eat whole natural foods, hit your protein targets, here's what'll happen. You'll eat the right amount. Now, will you get shredded? No. You're not going to get to 17% as a female doing that, but you'll get down to the low 20s. The average woman will get down to a nice, healthy, lean body fat percentage doing that because that's where your body wants to sit. There's this terrible myth out there that, that humans are eating machines and if you just put food in front of us, we'll just eat like crazy. No, that's only the case because we've <laughs> introduced incredible variety and in processed foods and we've hacked our our systems of satiety. But if you put, you know, you go hunt and you kill an animal and you're like, all right, everybody eat as much as you want. People would eat the appropriate amount because it's a, it's a whole natural food. If you do this, then you won't need to track. But that being said, is there value in tracking? Yes, because it is an awareness tool. Tracking it teaches people what's in food, how many grams of proteins, how many grams of carbs, how do I feel when I eat more carbs? How do I feel when I eat more fats? How do I feel when I eat this kind of thing or that kind of thing? And when my calories are higher in the day versus lower in the, you know, lower in the day, it is an awareness tool. But if it's a trigger for you, I'd say don't go for it. Do what I said earlier and you'll be just fine. If you want to get really lean, tracking becomes more appropriate because now you're asking yourself to get leaner than what would be considered optimal for health. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I know for me, when I first started, I had such little knowledge around nutrition. I didn't even understand what a fat carb or protein was. Right. So for me, it was kind of essential. And once I had it figured out, I said, okay, I roughly know what I'm consuming in a day and I can move forward. Right. And it still is helpful for me to have that knowledge. Yes. So that's why it's valuable. It's just, there's that subset of the population where if you have them track it, it's not good. They 100%. like they jump off. Like I can't do this or it puts them down kind of this dark path. Because it's a lot of numbers and it becomes a little bit analytical, I think. Yes. And you know, look, all right, let's 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 talk about how what, what, what it looks like to have a good, healthy relationship with food. So any skill that you learn, you have to go through uh, four stages of learning. And they, they, they go like this. There's unconscious incompetence. There's conscious incompetence. There's conscious competence and then there's unconscious competence. So what does this look like? Okay. Let's start, let's start with the first one, which is unconscious un un incompetence. You don't know that you don't know. This is like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know anything. Conscious incompetence is when you're aware of what you don't know. Like, oh, food has macros and calories. Okay, like I don't know any of this stuff, right? Then you move to the third stage, which is conscious competence. I'm tracking, I'm counting, I'm paying attention. You don't want to live there though, because that can become very hyper-focused and stressful. You want to move to the fourth stage, which is, unconscious competence where I eat healthy, feels very natural. It's not stressful. So think of it like a child learning how to walk. A kid doesn't know how to walk. They're probably not even aware of what that is. Then they try to start walking. Then they figure out real quick. They don't know how to walk. Then they're consciously competent. You watch a toddler walk. I have, I have two young kids and one of them, my, my youngest is one year old, right? So we're soon, we're going to get to this process of her trying to walk. You watch a toddler walk. They have to think about every step because they have to consciously be competent. Well, at some point, you, you know, do you think about every step when you walk or every breath you take? Like, that would be very stressful, right? Yeah. Hopefully, I didn't make your audience all of a sudden aware of their breathing. <laughs> that's now weird. I'm overthinking everything. Yeah, but, but that's, so that's what happens. That's how tracking should be used, right? Yeah. So tracking is that comp competent stage where you're competently, comp uh, you know, conscious of it or conscious of your competence. But then you should move into this kind of, it's natural, like yep. I eat healthy because I'm caring for myself. This feels good. I need more of this or I'm enjoying myself so now I can enjoy these foods. And it's this, this, this harmonious, like not stressful state of being. 
How do you recommend people figure out their maintenance calories and where to move from there? The only accurate way to do it that I know of is to track. Uh, so the way I would have clients do it is I'd say track your calories now. Don't change your eating. Don't change any of your eating habits. Just track. Write yeah. them down and track them. After two weeks, get your average. And unless you were gaining or losing a lot of weight in that period of time, which you shouldn't have if you were just eating like you normally would, then that's roughly what your maintenance is at. And then you can move from there. The calorie estimating websites are very general and they could be very, very off, uh, especially if you have like a strength training female. Um, I mean, I've had female clients that were tiny strength training. They did a lot of strength training. They were eating like 2,800 calories a day, but the calorie counters would tell them to do, you know, something closer to like 16 or 1,700 calories. So it could be very off. You could also have through repeated cycles of extreme dieting and, and cardio, you could have really hammered your metabolism to the point where you're not burning very many calories at all, in which case you would want a reverse diet. What I did, I've done a reverse diet. Yeah. It was a little bit of a mental struggle, of course. but uh, it was helpful. At the beginning of my fitness journey, I tracked, figured out my maintenance. I cut back very slowly, which is what I've always recommended. I've always said, you know, cut back as little as possible. Yes. So you have room. Is that what you recommend as well? Totally. Because mostly there's other reasons too, but mostly for the, we, we have to remember that we're not machines. We're behavior-based creatures. Okay. So too much of a change all at once, the likelihood of it being sustainable is far less. So, and food is a part of who we are. So we don't just eat for fuel. I know people in my space like to say that, but that's such that's so stupid. We eat for a lot of different reasons. We eat to celebrate, we eat because we're stressed, so we're sad, we eat for enjoyment. So all of a sudden cutting your calories drastically, uh, like you're changing a big part of your life. And if you think that that drastic tough change is gonna stick around, like you're, you're fooling yourself. So small changes are just are just much more effective for sustainability. What would you say is like a reasonable amount of weight to be losing per week? Well, they're going to say that the most, in terms of pure body fat, that you would that if you're doing everything right and you're doing it in a sustainable way, by the way, I want to say this, it's not fast or slow. People think what I'm saying is the slow way. There's a faster way, but it's the wrong way. No, no, no. It's not fast or slow. It's yes or no. The, the fast way, you will not get what you want and you won't stay where you want. The data is 100% clear on this. 90% of people who lose weight gain it back. We don't have a weight loss problem. We have a keep the weight off problem. Okay, so what I'm saying isn't the slow way. It's the only way, okay? Okay, so if you do everything right, you can expect about one to two pounds of body fat a week if you do everything right. Now, do most people experience that? No, because there's a lot more than just weight loss that's happening. There's learning about how I feel, and, and this is important to pay attention to. How's my energy? How's my skin? How's my mood? How's my sleep? Am I stronger? Uh, do I feel, is my libido healthy? Like pay attention to all those things because those are all signal you that you're doing the right thing and then the, the fat loss will happen. Yeah, there's so many other factors than the scale when you, it comes to weight loss. You know what's funny? So I trained people for years. This used to shock, shock me, but people would come in and they'd be working out and I'd tell them, look, I'm, we're not gonna try for any weight loss for the first couple months. I'm gonna speed up your metabolism, get you stronger. And they'd, so, so they'd come in and they'd be like, okay, I wanna lose weight, I wanna lose weight, I'm not losing any yet, but I understand you said that. And I'd say, well, you know, how's your sleep been? And they'll say, oh, that's weird. It's funny you say that. I've been sleeping so good. I'm like, okay, that's great. And how's your energy been? That's interesting, you know, I, I'm drinking one cup of coffee less a day than I normally do. You know, how's your mood? Oh, I feel so much more upbeat. They're not even paying attention to those things. So it doesn't even register because they're so hyper-focused on the scale. So it's very important to take note of all the other positive effects that improving your health will bring. And improving your health will improve every aspect of your life, everything. There isn't a single thing that it won't touch. So pay attention to those things because when the scale isn't moving, it's gonna help you stay on the right track. And it'll also paint a much fuller, complete picture of what's going on. Also, weight loss doesn't keep happening. At some point, you're going to stop losing weight. And if that's all you're focused on, you'll find yourself in a place where you're like, why do I keep doing this? Yeah. So pay attention to everything. Yeah. My audience listening knows what an impact health and fitness had on my life. I wouldn't have a podcast, a business. It taught me everything I know about work ethic. Like it truly, truly changed everything for me. I went into it, you know, 
pretty much been controlled by a mood disorder and that mm. it helped so much food and exercise have completely changed my life so for anyone listening who's embarking on their journey there's so much benefit that can come from this do you know what do you know what it is what 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 fitness is or health this pursuit of health is it's one of the most powerful vehicles for personal growth part of it is because it's unassuming when you started working out you want to just lose weight. You, you weren't like, I'm going to get on a personal growth journey. You're like, I'm just going to lose weight. If you stick to it long enough, here's what you end up getting out of it. You end up developing a different relationship with struggle and pain. Okay? So when you first start working out, it, the hurt hurts differently than when you've been doing it for a long time. Trust me, my workouts hurt as much or more than to somebody who's never done it before who just started. But I have a different relationship with that pain. Do you think there's carryover to the rest of my life with that? Absolutely. So that's one. Two, body acceptance. So someone listening might be like, what do you mean body acceptance? I'm trying to change my body. Do this long enough and you're going to be like, I'm not going to look like that person on Instagram. But you know what? I like the way I look. I like the way I feel. I'm going to keep doing this anyway. Body acceptance starts to kick in. Um, discipline. You develop the skill of discipline. Well, what's discipline? Well, discipline is doing the things that are good for you or doing things that you should do when you don't feel like it, motivation comes and goes. For you to be consistent with fitness over time, it means you're going to work out when motivation goes away because motivation goes away. I never, had to, <laughs> I never had to encourage a motivated client to work out. I never had to encourage a motivated client to eat right. They were motivated. It's when they weren't motivated that it was a challenge. So fitness helps to teach you that as well. Here's what else fitness does. And you, you're probably experiencing this yourself. It's a gateway to other personal growth because you start to master exercise, you master diet, you feel good. You're like, huh, what's this spirituality thing? Huh, what's this meditation thing? Maybe I should look at sleep. What about relationship health? Or what about, and it starts to bleed into all these other things. So it's just, it's just this incredible, and of course it changes your, physiology, how you think, changes your mental state. It's the most powerful antidepressant and anti-anxiety method that we've identified. If it was in a pill, it would be a blockbuster. Yeah. I felt like I had this secret after I went through my fitness journey. I was like, oh my gosh, like, why aren't we all doing this? I know. And I became obsessed with optimizing everything, productivity, mindset, other health and fitness. You know, it's, it's really ignited something in me that I didn't even know was there prior, which is amazing. Yeah. What would you say to anyone listening who's maybe intimidated to step into the gym? And I think this is important if anyone has like a new year's resolution or something, mm -hmm. what if they're nervous about the judgment they might get at the gym? Boy, okay. I understand the intimidation because you're walking into a space, you're not familiar, you're not proficient, and you're seeing these other people who are seem to know what they're doing. So I've experienced that many times. I'll walk into space and it's like, oh my God, everybody knows what they're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. So it makes you self-conscious. But here's what I'll say about that. The most, and I'll stand by this all day long. By the way, anybody who's worked in gyms or, or worked out for a long time will stand by this. The most accepting place on earth is the gym. People talk about inclusivity and whatever. The most accepting place you'll ever be is in a gym. And the most accepting gyms are the most hardcore gyms. This is a fact. Everybody, if you go in there, you could be 500 pounds. You could be, you have the worst health. You could have no understanding of exercise. You could walk in there and you just try and you'll feel and see what I'm talking about because everybody's been there. Everybody in there is pursuing the same thing. My friend, I have a good friend, Father Steve. He's a priest and he's he runs Bishop Barron's Media. He's, this, uh, he's a Catholic bishop with this big media channel. Father Steve also works out, right? That's so... He told me, this was literally his quote, he said, the church has a lot to learn from the gym with that. He says it's the most, because he, he's like, you walk in, nobody cares who you vote for, what you look like, none of that stuff. You're, you're in here, you're trying, and everybody's like, yes, let's do this. And test this out, go to a hardcore gym, go tap on the scariest person that you see in there and say, hey, I'm, I, it's my first time, I don't know how to do this, and watch what happens. They'll automatically become your free trainer. It's such an incredible environment. Now, I get the whole intimidation because of the, you know, you don't know what you're doing or whatever. That's why I say go in there and practice these exercises like skills. There's lots of resources. I sell fitness programs that outline out what you do. I have a, a YouTube channel that where we demonstrate exercises. It's free, so you can watch those. 
But you'll see. And, and once you figure that out, it's like, oh my gosh, it's the best place. I was just telling a story about, you know, I go to Gold's Gym Venice oh, yeah. and I had a girlfriend start coming with me and she was like, I don't know, it's pretty <laughs> intimate. Like there's huge guys in there. Yeah. And I was like, I promise you the biggest guys are the nicest. Yes. And now they hype us up. They're like, is that a new PR? Oh my gosh, oh, yeah. I saw you benching the other day. It really is such a encouraging place. And I've been there too when I first started. I was super insecure to walk into a gym because I felt like I was overweight. I didn't fit in. I didn't know what was going on. But slowly but surely, if you just keep showing up and even if you don't have the best workout ever, even if you're just there for 30 yeah. minutes and you get comfortable in the space, that confidence really does build. Play your favorite music, wear a hat if you need to. That really helped me stay in the zone and mm -hmm. stop looking at other people, kind of like blinders. And yeah, it's a great place to make friends too like-minded individuals totally. I find. it's so. all growth minded and if 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 you have the ability the ability hiring a coach or trainer who's really good is worth their weight in gold like in in really obviously they know exercise they know technique they don't know how to apply it but what they are is they're a guide and they're going to guide you on this journey and a really good coach or trainer's goal is to get you to the point where you could do this on your own for the rest of your life and so so if you find one that's good here's some here's some some telltale signs that you're working with someone good um, they don't beat the crap out of you in your workouts. You leave feeling better than you did when you walked in. They train you appropriately. They assess you. They don't just take you in a workout. They assess you. They answer a lot of questions with the answer, it depends, because it's very nuanced. Is this the best diet? It depends. Is this the best exercise? Well, it depends. That's how you know you probably have a good trainer. They're worth their weight in gold if you can find one, even if you work with them once a week or once every other week, they will really help you. And there's online coaches that are less expensive. They're not going to be able to train you in person, but really, really good ones will help you uh, so much. But yeah, go in there. It's funny, you know, when I when I first started, I started in the gym business in 90, 1997, so it's a long time ago. And in the in the first gym I worked in, they had a women's only area. And I remember, you know, after the gym closed one night, I went in there and it was hilarious because it was the same equipment. It was just pink. And I remember <laughs> I remember thinking like, how silly is this or whatever? Anyway, you know, in that gym, eventually they remodeled it, had this big weight area. And at that time, you know, you're talking the late 90s, women were not in the free weight area. Almost never. I mean, it was rare. And I remember there was this woman, I signed her up. I talked to her about this. She was in her mid 40s. She was super intimidated. But I said, no, and she didn't have the money to afford a trainer. So I said, here's a few exercises. I said, just go in the corner, do your thing. So she was like one of the only women in there she worked at. And she quickly, like all the big like bros in there, whatever. She was like, they, they, they were like protecting her, showing her what to do, helping her out. And she's like, I did not expect this at all. I'm like, I'm telling you, it's the best place. Wow, <laughs> yeah. that's so cute. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And now I think it's awesome seeing the spike in women who are Huge. interested in weightlifting. It's incredible. Huge. In fact, uh, gyms now are taking space away from other, uh, like from cardio equipment or things and, and putting it towards- uh, Hip thrust with, machines. <laughs> yes. By the way, we're, we're, we're really in this revolution of, uh, of strength training because, and, and women are driving this. Women are very powerful consumers. So now that women are starting to adopt it, um, the fitness industry is really starting to, to pay attention. But now we have really good data to show that it's it's benefits on fat loss, on sculpting, on hormone balancing. Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, I don't know if you've had her on. I need to. She just wrote a great book uh, about this and how the obesity epidemic really is about the being under-muscled uh, epidemic. So I think we're starting to see this wonderful swing that I, I couldn't be happier to see. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible but not if you guess along the way. So we're gonna talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now there's a huge range, right, of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body.